Oh, we're live, boys. Let's go. <laughs> you know, the Grizzles lost his voice. I've, it's been a heck of a week. Um, now, we had a little bit of uh, – we had to move things around because, obviously, you know, good a good friend of the Grizzle, Doomberg, uh, he got called for some uh, – a jury duty a late well, jury duty. even <laughs> even the green chicken isn't immune from jury duty oh man but he, he was kind of, you know what he's uh, apparently we're good he hasn't been selected but we're gonna move him around scott what the new time is twelve forty-five for doomberg yeah so let's look, give a little bit bit of background here what are you guys in, in for so whether you're an expert on uranium or you're just looking at the industry because i know there's been a lot of exciting news lately you're there's going to be something for everyone here we have an absolutely stacked lineup of the operators and analysts. So the whole gamut, we, we put together a pretty stellar lineup. 
Let me take you through who you're going to hear from. Oh, and don't forget an investor as well. One of the greats, Rick Rule. Oh, Rick Rule's <laughs> going to be on later too. Yeah, yeah we got it's, it all. It's, it's, a great, it's a great afternoon. Uh, yeah, Scott, go hit the lineup. All right, lineup. let me tell you who we got. So we got, first, we're coming up with Chris Kiefer. He's head of Canadians for Nuclear Energy. Then we have Justin Hune. He's the founder of Uranium Insider. Anyone on Twitter, you probably know this guy and YouTube. Then we have Corey Diaz. He's CEO of Anfield Energy followed up by Corey Bellick. He's the CEO of Can Alaska Uranium. Then we have Dev Randawa. He's chairman and CEO of Fission 3. Then we have William Sheriff. He's chairman of Encore Energy, followed up by the man Rick Rule of Rule Investment Media. Then we have David Talbot. He's the head of research at Red Cloud Securities. A lot of good insights there. And we're finishing it off. We got Mark Wolbert. He's the founder of Contrarian Codex. And actually, because we shuffle some things around, we get to kick it off. We're, we're bookending it with the man himself, the green chicken, Doomberg. So it's going to be a packed agenda. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's a, a very exciting afternoon. Guys, thank you so much for coming through. It's, it, you know, always, it, you know what impresses me the most, Scott? Um, you know, we, the, the community around uranium is so strong. You know, it's, it's one of, in terms of, in terms of due diligence, uh, you know, obviously we got a lot of folks here today uh, with, with uranium insider and, and, and uh, more with uh, more Wolbert, you know, we, we've got, you know, when you look at YouTube, Twitter, it's just an incredible, uh, incredible resource really, Scott. Yeah. And don't forget everyone, this is a live show, right? So get in the chat, st you know, talk, whatever you want to tell us questions. We'll do our best to try to ask the guests if we have extra time, but that's the beauty of this format, right? We're, we're chatting with you. You're here, right? You're right here with us. So it's supposed to be a fun time. Yeah, I know for sure. And, and so, so, you know what I need, I wanted to set the stage uh, cause we actually don't do this, you know, so I thought it would be nice to set the stage cause it, it this is an investment conference and uh, we, we have a, we have a host of great companies, uh, Rick Rule and, and, uh, and Red, Red Cloud Financial. Scott, first we gotta we gotta thank those that made it the partners, the partners that made this happen. So let's uh let's let's pull up the partner slide. There we go. Um yeah, so uh you know, so we gotta thank Doomberg, Uranium Insider, uh, and Grizzle Research and Quant. So uh Red Cloud, um, and so and the and first without without a doubt, Red Cloud is a source for the high quality mining research and insights. You gotta check them out, and then Doomberg. You guys know them. They D Doomberg produces some of the best quality research across the board. He was effortlessly talking about um, effortlessly talking about uh, the, all the mayhem that was in crypto just a couple of days ago. And and if you saw him on our last uh, uh, on our last uranium conference, he, you know he's just a wealth of information. Uh, Doomberg is the number one finance Substack, Scott. Yeah, and so how do you find him? Is it Doomberg.substack? Yeah, Doomberg, Doomberg.substack.com, and then Uranium Insider. You know, uh, like Justin, he's a legend. He's a legend in in the uh, in the uranium investing field. Uh, that's Uranium Insider, and then Grizzle uh, Scott. You want to talk to Grizzle Grizzle Quant? Yeah, so Grizzle Research and Quant is our new newsletter and Substack. We're trying to do things a bit differently. We're using the power of Quant, which you don't see a lot of that on Substack. So we're we're marrying Quant with fundamental research to come up with stock ideas, help you understand what's going on in the market, and then most importantly, put together portfolios, sector-specific portfolios, and overall diversified risk-managed portfolios. Basically, what we did when we used to have to work at the big banks, we're taking you inside the process and giving you some ideas as well. So a little bit of something for everyone. That's grizzleresearch.substack.com. Yeah. All right, so let's let's get into well, it. Well, so yeah, so uh, so let's so one thing we haven't done, and you know, actually, this could be a new start to the conferences. Uh, let's just talk about how how things are performing. It's nice; it's December. We're getting close to the end of the year. Let's talk year to date, guys. Um, let's pull up. Uh, if we can pull up, this is a nice one. We're all commodity investors here, guys, and I think it's it's useful to look at how the commodities have done year to date. I brought up uh, just a few the ones we know. Um, so the blue line there, that is, uh, that is nickel, right? And so Scott, I actually, I'm going to pull this up because I have to see this better. Uh, and so nickel is, is the star performer this year. Let me, let me just grab the, grab the actual number. So nickel is up 34% this year. It's, it's been a stellar year for nickel. Uh, it's got an interesting point on nickel. Uh, you want to talk about how the nickel stocks have done it? It's, they've gone the opposite direction. Yeah. So, you know, usually the, the stocks, you know, they make money off the commodities, so they should track the commodity pretty closely. But you see with nickel, it's been a totally different story. The nickel price has been pretty strong, as Tom said, but the stocks, we, we put together 
together a custom basket of all the global nickel miners, and they're down a lot this year. The spread is actually 90% over yep. the years. So it just shows that investors, just they're, the stocks themselves, the producers are totally unloved, but not the nickel price. So there yeah. may be an opportunity. So that's nickel. That's a blue line. Uh, then you get to the white line, the next line right there, if you guys see that on the screen. That is our beloved uranium, and that's the Sprott Uranium Trust. That's up 6.3%. So not a, not a bad showing. You know, uh, obviously, you would think all of, you know, all of the tailwinds this year, you know, you feel that it feels like that price should be a lot higher, but, um, uh, compared to markets, it's not so bad. actually. Exactly. Then, uh, the next is oil, you know, what a ride for oil, uh, basically flat this year, Scott mm -hmm. up 1.4%. Wow. And then you look at all that movement, right. To only be flat. If you just, you got to this point, but we, we know there's been a lot of geopolitical tensions and now there's worries about yep. uh, growth. So that's kind of taken some of the wind out of sales of, of the oil market. But what's interesting, Tom, Yes, yes. And so, so just so in the same way nickel was the flip where nickel's up and stocks are down, talk to oil, Scott. Yeah, so oil's the exact opposite of that. The stocks have actually been holding in better than the oil price. And that rarely happens. We looked over history and almost every time that the oil price falls, the stocks end up following it. So this shows that investors don't necessarily believe that there's as much weakness in growth and that supply is maybe as strong as as the oil price thinks. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out, but totally the opposite of what's happening in in um, in, in nickel. And then the last one uh, there, and then, then we can kill the graph, Zach. Um, the last one there is copper. Copper's down 14%. Uh, so obviously, you know, the, Dr. Copper, clearly, uh, you know, with, with the yield curve inverted, et cetera. So yeah, and, and so, so Zach, yeah, perfect. And then, so now let's, let's, drill further into uh, uranium. So uh, now we're going to pull up uh, um, uh, the chart, then, then here we go. So this is now looking at, of course, the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust, the physical versus global X, the global X uranium ETF. So Scott, you have an issue here where uh, the stocks, the the the, the uranium miners uh, have been lagging. So they're down 14, 15%, 14 percent, 14.9%. So 15% year to date. While uh, as we discussed earlier, the spot physical uranium trust is up six. Now I know in the Global X Uranium ETF, there is a 20% component of the Sprott um, Physical Uranium Trust, but irrespective, that you know that's a good uh, overview of how the stocks have done. Uh, we can so we can kill that graph, but that, I think Scott, that gives a good layout here, and I think that's why why this is a, an interesting time to have the conference in the sense that you have a situation where typically, um, you know, as as commodities do well. The, the underlying producers should do better because of why leverage? <laughs> leverage. Remember, these guys have fixed costs, right? Just because oil or uranium doubles in price, their costs don't double in price. So that's why it makes sense. If a commodity goes up a dollar, the earnings of the producer should go up more than a dollar. But it, the stocks don't always work like that. And that often creates opportunity. Yeah, it's uh, so so. You know what? I think that's a you know we we you know when when we heard Doomberg was uh you know we, he he was uh he was uh, he got juried. He was working uh, for the man. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The man got him. I'm like I'm like I, how could anyone not pick a green chicken to to do jury duty? It's uh they got they. But yeah, wait. how did he get off the hook? Actually, I'm very surprised. <laughs> we got lucky. Uh, it's a grizzle, grizzle's fortune, but he's gonna he's gonna come on at the end uh because he you know can't be a uranium he can't be a uranium nuclear conference without. The, the without Doomberg himself. Um, but I think it's a nice start to the conference to really set the table, if you will. Uh, it's been an incredible, incredible, powerful year for commodities. W one thing I didn't show, and I, you know, I, 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 you know, likely it, the markets have been terrible re uh, for other risk asset classes, right? So Scott, typically when we see the NASDAQ down, what we're, we're, you know, we're down to, uh, you know, close to 30% this year, like 20, 28 and change or whatever. Um, it's a very rare that you you know you see commodities are viewed as risk risk as well. Yeah, in and, a growth scare situation, you usually don't have commodities leading. Exactly, and and so you know, and, and copper obviously is reflecting two things right now. Uh, we you know we are a grizzles bull, bullish on on uranium. You know that's why we're here. We're bullish on the, on nuclear. We are experiencing a renaissance. Uh, we had a great interview with uh, Chris Kiefer coming up. Uh, you know the change is happening. It's happening in real time right now. Uh, we'll discuss more obviously with Doomberg about all that's you know that's happening in Europe. But it's you know we are we there's a huge opportunity to catch up um, for for really structural issues that that should have that basically have been permeating for the last 20 years Scott
We've been building the we we've been building power all wrong. Um, we need to address base load, and when it comes to base load, it doesn't get better and 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 uh, uh, better and smarter than nuclear. Uh, that you know that we're gonna we're gonna see a renaissance. Uh, you know that's happening right now. Um, you know Europe. What's what's happened to Europe is just a taste of 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 you know where we need to go. Yeah. All right. Well, enough talking from us. Thank you for being here. This is Grizzle Uranium One on One. We're going to get started really soon with our guests. Coming up in two minutes is Chris Kiefer. He's head of Canadians for Natural Energy. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. And remember, put your, any comments you have below. for joining us <laughs> it, well, it feels like you're coming me. from the north pole yeah it's cold up here uh, but <laughs> where, i'm on my way to Sudbury to give a talk from, at the actually. medical school and uh, i've got a flat tire so i'm uh, here in perry sound in an auto shop it's a little little chilly <laughs> oh my goodness it's a place without nuclear power clearly <laughs> Well, no, we're in Ontario. Um, no, and, you know, our power plants are in the south, but a good amount of the juice up here is uh, <laughs> coming from splitting atoms. Oh, well, 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 thank you so much for joining us today. And we've never actually gotten the chance to, spoke, to speak. So thank you so much for, for coming on the Grizzly Uranium one-on-one -on -one conference. And just for those that don't know, I know you're the president of Canadians for Nuclear Energy. Can you just tell us a bit about the goals of your organization, what it is, and if there was really ever like a pivotal moment that really got you interested in being, you know, an advocate for, for nuclear energy? Yeah, for sure. I mean, my story is a bit of a weird one. Um, I'm a medical professional by training. Um, I've had a lot of kind of side interests um, and, and human rights activism prior to getting interested in nuclear. Um, and that was mostly around issues of, you know, refugee, uh, immigrant rights. Uh, I worked as a consulting physician at the Canadian Centre for Victims of Torture. Uh, so how on earth did I get interested in nuclear and uranium? Uh, my son was born about four years ago, and like a lot of parents in this generation, when you start thinking out 80 years ahead instead of your own selfish life, um, you start to wrestle with some of these questions. Um, and 
started going deep into climate change, getting a little depressed and uh, started to be a little more solutions focused. And uh, living here in Ontario, I joke we're the France of North America uh, in that about 60 percent of our grid is uh, supplied by nuclear. Um, I found that we were onto something here. Um, and that led to, to forming this organization with a, uh, you know, a group of uh, compatriots uh, across, uh, across Ontario and across the internet, really. Um, and over the last two and a half years, we've seen a lot of success. We started off, you know, holding an in-person event in uh, downtown square in Toronto, mostly talking to homeless folks and uh, folks with mental illness there on the streets, whoever would chat with us. And, you know, just uh, over the course of the last three months, I met with the Prime Minister of Canada, Justin Trudeau, to talk about nuclear with him, uh, wow. as well as the Premier of Ontario here. And uh, Ontario, I have to say, I think is the most pro-nuclear political jurisdiction in the Western world right now. So uh, it's it's interesting to be in this position and just to see how rapidly the, the scene is changing. And and that's super interesting, especially because we know nuclear is is a, a great power source for Ontario. But what do you think of Europe's energy crisis? And can you tell us about you know the risks of running headlong into you know windmills and solar uh, panels as as a main source of energy? Do you have an opinion on that? I sure do, as you might imagine. I mean, a lot of folks in Europe are saying, hey, this is all related to pipeline politics and to what's gone on with the Russian invasion of Ukraine. But I was in Europe um, last year before all of that. Um, my, my organization attended COP26 uh, in Glasgow, and we made a pit stop in Berlin, actually, to protest alongside renowned climate scientist James Hansen about the closure of their remaining nuclear fleet. And, you know, I'm sure many of the people watching this today know about the app electricity map where you can basically see anywhere in the world what the generation mix is. Well, it was majority coal. I mean, 2021 in Europe had an extreme weather event. It wasn't a hurricane, though. It was something called a wind drought. And we're seeing a, a touch of that right now. But, you know, coal, even prior to the Russian invasion, even when they had copious amounts of Russian gas, was the number one source of electricity on their grid despite about a 500 billion euro investment in wind and solar. So what we've seen is a you know, massive misallocation of capital, capital by the Europeans. Um, you know, estimates are if they'd spent that money on nuclear, Germany would have a completely decarbonized electricity grid and would be well on their way to decarbonizing other sectors like transportation and certainly not dependent on you know, as much gas from, from Vladimir Putin. Interesting. And, and just on that point, you know, we have seen a lot of hesitancy towards nuclear. Does nuclear need any like new technologies to overcome this NIMBY movement? Or do you think social opinion is already shifting now that energy security is becoming a, a, a main issue for a lot of countries right now? Well, it's interesting. I mean, just look at the UK, um, where under Boris Johnson, you know, as this energy crisis went into hyperdrive with the Russian invasion, all of a sudden they were talking about, we're not going to be opening a nuclear plant every decade. We're going to be trying to open a nuclear plant every year. You know, the foundation of great British nuclear, a whole new government entity focused on trying to bring private capital into the sector to fund nuclear plants, to streamline regulations and, and site permitting and, and such. I mean, this is not anything we imagined even a short time ago that government would be getting involved to try and de-risk the sector, for instance. Mm -hmm. And that's not because public opinion flipped overnight. That's because of these imperatives of energy security, for instance. Um, so we are seeing a big shift in opinion. You know, Poland's another country that's looking at doing a pretty massive nuclear build out, uh, feeling the pressure of being right on the border with Russia, the victim of these pipeline politics. Um, and public opinion has shifted there dramatically from, uh, you know, about 40 percent uh, approval of new nuclear up to high 70s now. Um, so we're seeing seeing large changes and even in anti nuclear bastions like Germany, reality is knocking hard on on the door there and amongst at least amongst the public they've swung pro-nuclear even if the political class and this government formed in part by the green party is is heading in this kind of death dash towards you know closing a large uh, portion of their electricity generation and the worst energy crunch since the opec crisis yeah chris and yeah, maybe you can help help understand that it just it just seems so wild is is so uh, do we have recent polls like because it seems like the parties are entrenched that that it's you know they, they you know that we're not going back to that nuclear world uh, or i would love to kind of get get you know a better understanding of of you know how the cascade will change from from public opinion and you know and you know changing political opinion uh you know just what what the backdrop is there curious on that 
you know, it's interesting. Um, you know, I, I'm from Canada. I, I think you guys are broadcasting out of the U.S. We have, you know, first past the post political system, which sometimes, frankly, uh, is not really fair. Like the, the popular vote won't really align with political representation. And so a lot of folks are, are for something called proportional representation, which we see quite a lot of in European countries. Now, that makes fringe parties that only, you know, get seven, eight percent of the vote potentially quite powerful. And in Europe, we have a number of green parties um, who uh, form part of a coalition government and ask for one ministry in particular. And it's often the energy ministry. And we see that in countries like <laughs> Belgium, for instance, Tin van der Straten. Interestingly, uh, you know, a former lawyer representing a subsidiary of Gazprom in Belgium, um, who is, you know, engineering the shutdown of 50 percent of the generation on their grid. That's the Belgian nuclear fleet and its replacement by gas. And similarly, in, in, uh, in Germany, you have uh, Mr. Habeck. I mean, this guy's uh, best known as a uh, children's uh, writer. He has a PhD in literature, somehow got a hold of the, uh, the energy file, um, and, and is, is hell-bent ideologically on this. Now, I mean, elections are going to take a while. There'll be a new election in Germany. Things might shift. There certainly are pro-nuclear parties within Germany. Um, but public opinion is not being reflected uh, particularly now um, in, in the representation, certainly in Germany, when you look at popular polling versus, you know, what the government is doing and I have to give them a little bit of credit. They've delayed that shutdown that was planned for December 31st until April. Great. And, and I know you've been tweeting. I just want to pivot here. I know you've been tweeting your thoughts on that big fusion announcement uh, earlier this week from U.S. scientists. Do you think this is like a breakthrough moment for the nuclear energy industry? Because I know people have been trying to get fusion going for for decades. No, I mean, this is a scientific breakthrough. It's, it's very exciting from a research perspective. But in terms of translating that into, you know, energy on the grid, that is still a long, long ways away. I mean... What wasn't taken into account there was that you had 500 megajoules powering the laser, which deposited, you know, two megajoules uh, and you got three megajoules out. There's still a huge deficit there. And as we know, scaling up energy generation technologies is nothing like scaling up, uh, you know, smartphones or computers or things like that. This takes a long time. We have a technology um, which is which is ready to go, which is deployed, which is proven, and that is fission. Um, so we should be paying attention to the fusion space, but I don't think deluding ourselves into thinking that fusion is going to be providing a significant source of electricity, let alone energy, global primary energy. Um, so very interesting news, but um, I think people are probably you know over generously interpreting it. Chris, I have a question with regards to, you know, you always hear about the speed and efficiency with which China can, uh, you know, it can build nuclear nuclear facilities. And and I don't believe, you know, we're in the Western world, we're anywhere close to that. You know, the U.S. Uh, recent examples have, have been, let's be frank, like they, they've been disastrous, right? Um, what can we learn from China? And then I get secondarily, you know, and coming back to one of you know, the earlier points just the, around the NIMBY, I just trying to understand that all better. And, and you know, where, how, because obviously we need to fix this. It's just, how do we do that? Yeah, no, it's a good question. I mean, this isn't unique to China. This is something I study a lot on my podcast, Decouple. I've had over 170 experts on um, really deep diving this. It's something I call the nuclear secret sauce because around the world, country after country successfully deployed nuclear on budget and on time. We saw that in the U.S. in the late 60s, in my own country, Canada in the 70s and 80s, France in the 80s, 90s, you know, Japan in the 90s, South Korea, early 2000s, China now. And there is a, a mix there, uh, and it consists of a number of really important factors. One is, you know, low cost capital, no doubt. Another one is, you know, sensible, stable regulations and a generally supportive government. That's super important. Having a design which is proven that you can standardize and build in serial uh, production, hopefully on the same site. Um, and then there's this this key missing element that the industry itself tends to ignore a lot, and that is the human factor side of it having the skilled labor, skilled trades available, having a supply chain that's ramped up. So those are the sort of things that are all aligned in China, um, that, for instance, were all aligned in South Korea until they got a very anti-nuclear uh, president who kind of wrecked their nuclear program. Luckily, they've elected new leadership, which is pro-nuclear. They should be back on track. But that's what 
we need to be paying attention to rather than, you know, getting drawn into, well, this new design on a blueprint seems to offer all the solutions to, you know, the problems of nuclear design is one element of these kind of five factors I've mentioned in the secret sauce um, that we have to make attention, paying attention more broadly. And a lot of these are going to be responsive to social policy and hence the role of, of advocacy organizations like my own and trying to, in trying to create those policies. And some critics have said that high costs and, you know, long construction cycles have made renewables, uh, you know, competitive with nuclear today. What do you say to that? Well, you can't make an apples and oranges comparison here. Around the world, you know, every time a nuclear plant closes, it's replaced by gas and coal. And I should tell you something, right? What makes nuclear... Uh, very useful, especially in an energy crisis where fossil fuels are becoming scarce, is that it can replace fossil fuel services. And we saw that in Ontario, where I'm from, our grid was 25% coal in the early 2000s. And we use nuclear for 90% of the power to replace coal. We replaced like with like. So you really can't make that comparison. And, you know, what you're quoting there would be levelized cost of electricity numbers, which, of course, don't take into account all of the grid integration costs of wind and solar. And just as wind and solar aren't cheap when you factor in the gas backup generally that's required, they're also not particularly low carbon when you factor in that, uh, that gas. So, you know, a useful expression uh, my friend Mark Nelson came up with is that wind and solar are a very cheap way to make expensive electricity and nuclear is an expensive way to make <coughs> cheap electricity. Listen, that's a, that's a great line. And, and Chris, uh, just there, there was a question here. Uh, if, if I could get you a one minute takeaway, the question is, uh, which small nu uh, nuclear uh, reactor technology does Chris, Chris think, think. Uh, offers the best solution? Uh, just, you know, I, I, I probably have yeah, a, put me on the hot seat. Your answer will be, but give me give me the one minute answer. For sure. I mean, I tend to be a little bit technologically conservative. It took a long time for us to get our capacity factors on nuclear on our traditional technology up from around 60% where they were in the 60s and 70s to the 90s, which we see now, which is what makes nuclear economic. I think a lot of new technologies are going to struggle operationally, again, on that human factors side, that tacit knowledge side, to make sure that they're getting you know, all the bang for their buck out of that technology, running the plants around the clock. So, you know, in Ontario, we've decided on the BWRX 300 uh, for the West's first small modular reactor build. This is a 300 megawatt reactor being built at the Darlington nuclear site. I think that was a good choice. Um, and I think there's broad applicability for small modular reactors where there's smaller grids, uh, et cetera. Uh, but I am, I remain quite bullish on large nuclear and particularly being a, a can-do bro up here in Canada, I think there's a big role to, to bring back our, our large can-do reactors moving forward, at least uh, for several decades. Uh, Chris, can't thank you enough. Uh, I will leave you with this one uh, point. Um, Brandon Smith said, Chris's mustache may be the best performing <laughs> asset class this year. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, and uh, look forward to having you again. Thank sure, you thanks so for having me on, guys. And, and stay tuned with us. Up next, we have Justin Hewn from Uranium Insider. Welcome back to Uranium One on One. We're joined here by Justin Hewn, Uranium Insider. We spoke with him a few months ago. We're excited to catch up again. How are you, Justin? I'm doing great. Nice to see you guys. Thanks for having me on. 
Hey, Justin, always a pleasure. Thank you. Uh, you know, and uh, and thank you for being a great partner. You know, always, uh, it, it's a great community and you're, you're a big part of that uranium investing community, unlike any other sector in the world. It really is a great community, huh? Yeah, I'm, yeah, I, I love it. Yeah. yeah, it's cool. We're, we're lucky to be here. So, you know, we spoke in August and it's funny how much has happened on the world stage since then. So, you know, we got a lot of news flow when it comes to global acceptance that nuclear will play an important part in the future of en energy. Would you say the dam has broken or are we still waiting on kind of that one big piece of news? Oh, gosh. I mean, I think the dam is broken in terms of uh, in terms of actual fundamental developments for the sector. It's it's this is the easiest investment I've ever made by adding to positions here, in my opinion. Um, the, the sector has been so unbelievably de-risked in the past two years and especially the past 12 months. So while this is not the first inning, I would say that the last year has been a big reset to, to the valuations of the companies involved in the sector. And honestly, it's the, the last shoe to drop here is capital flows. And given the setup in the market, the setup in the spot market, the fact that a vehicle like Spud exists for for capital flows to actually affect the physical commodity in such a profound way. I really think that the capital flows are really the last thing to drop here. And when that happens, it should be a, a pretty incredible move to the upside, in my opinion. So everything is de-risked. I mean, the, the Inflation Reduction Act uh, supporting clean energy, both with investment tax credits and production tax credits for existing nuclear utilities, really effectively has de-risked the production of nuclear energy in the largest fleet in the world in the United States. That's a major, major deal. Um, and a lot of projects uh, in Europe, in addition, are, are getting life extensions and uh, we're looking at new builds in Europe as well. So, I mean, that's just one aspect of it. But yes, it's uh, I would say the dam is broken. I can't I can't believe the, the news flow that I see almost on a daily basis. I keep pinching myself. It's it's un, unbelievably positive, almost entirely positive. And, uh, and the last thing to happen is, is for the capital flows to come in. So we're, we're really excited here. I think I, I welcome the return of a contrarian investment. That's, that's really my sweet spot for fundamental investing is contrarianism. So, um, I loved the period from 2018, 2020, I loved being an accumulator and being confident in the thesis and that, that, uh, co that contrarian opportunity has come back to me. So, uh, I'm quite excited here. Yeah, when you're early, right, it makes it that much sweeter when it does start to play out because you you just you stuck tight during the the less easy times. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people call that the easy money, right? When you're when you're making contrarian bet, you're buying you're buying a sector when it was you know fifteen twenty billion total market capitalization and uh, and and completely out of favor, and you're betting on just a little bit of hope bringing it up. Um, and of course, that easy money is doing something that nobody else was doing and being patient and being way down on your positions, you know, being down 20, 30 plus percent before making a five X. And that's just kind of how contrary and fundamental bets work, especially in cyclical commodity sectors. So now we've had roughly at this point, maybe around a 30% pullback, maybe a little bit more for some, a little bit less for others uh, in terms of the highs of last year. Um, but we're actually up off the lows of the summer. Um, interestingly, because sentiment is far worse right now than it was in July, but URNM is actually up 10 or 15% here from the summer times, uh, uh, from the summertime lows, which is strange, but yeah, the, the easy money is not all that easy. I would say this is way easier because we're still at a $35 billion market capitalization for the entire sector. And the outlook for the sector is bright beyond belief. Got it. Now, you've been talking about flows a bunch, so I wanted to get into that because I know you do track ETF flows pretty closely. Could you give us an update on what you're seeing and kind of how flows compared now to August when we last spoke? They're roughly flat uh, since August. There's been a, a bit of issuance. There's been a bit of redemptions. It's roughly flat since August. Not a lot of capital flows happening this, uh, this year, especially since uh, April or so. Gotcha. Now, could you just refresh our memory and how important are those ETF flows to the price of uranium? Like, is, is it a big driver, the, the Sprott uranium ETF or uh, just help helps people who aren't very familiar with the vehicles? Like what what drives what? Sure. Well, the spot vehicle is held by the ETFs. So when there's capital flows into the ETF, some of that capital goes into spot. And if it's trading at a premium to discount, that'll actually equal uranium purchasing or capital capital issuance, uh, trust unit issuance, capital raising 
and uranium purchasing. But uh, it, the, the ETF flows tend to roughly be in line, historically speaking, with the flows into the physical trusts. So um, it's really just kind of a risk on risk off thing when it comes to this sector. When the risk is on and, and ETF flows are happening, we usually see money also going into the spot vehicle, uh, which prior was Uranium Participation Corporation, and that equals physical buying uh, with Sput's ATM. But generally speaking, the ETF flows are more just kind of, uh, you know, we call it the flywheel effect. It's just, it's you know, the money comes into the ETFs, the ETFs buy the underlying holdings and the whole sector moves. And you can really see that and kind of feel it when you watch the stocks on certain days. You can sort of sense when the ETFs are buying, you can sense when they're selling because the whole sector is kind of moving up or down in line with the ETFs. And, and that's, it's a big driver when the capital flows come in and the ETFs are, are the more liquid vehicles with the exception of maybe Cameco and Sput, uh, to some extent, uh, next gen because Adam prom, uh, but you're, when you really see the liquid vehicles get capital flows, that's when, you know, institutions are taking notice, even though the ETFs, there is larger retail ownership by URNM, um, URA is a bit more, a uh, bit more liquid, has a bit more institutional ownership, but yeah, the, the liquidity is what brings the, the bigger money into the ETFs and spot. Just uh, maybe just a question just on how you view, you, you know, as performance comes back, the, how large caps will perform versus small caps, how you see that playing out, you know, as we come back. Well, I mean, as a general rule, the, the large caps typically will be the more liquid, safer investments for larger investors. Um, so that's the Cameco and NextGen, the ETFs and SPUT. Pretty much. And there's a few others, you know, Denison, because Adam Prom, to some extent, Paladin. Um, and But typically in any sort of resource market, the quality small caps during a bull market typically will vastly, vastly outperform the large caps. With that said, there's a handful of small caps that are basically flat uh, over the last you know number of years where there's some that are up 10, 15, 20 X. So you have to be very, very uh, choosy about what you're buying in this sector. You know, the sentiment has been pretty bad over the last month. It seems like it's slightly improving right now for whatever reason. But, um, you know, I see some folks complaining on Twitter. It's like, I've been in this since 2017. When is it going to move? And I'm like, 2017? Okay, you, you went all in on one or two stocks and you did not choose well. I mean, that's pretty much how you can how you can complain about not being up or not being up sufficiently for your liking for that period of time. You have to choose well. Um, and honestly... I would suggest to anyone coming into the sector to put the work into the sector, not necessarily into stock picks first, because you have to have that understanding of the sector fundamentals in order to hang on, no matter what you're holding. Even large caps like Cameco have really violent swings. Um, but yes, you, you have to choose quality. So I, I know you have a lot of, uh, you have a very vibrant community. So you probably have a lot of people that are new and people that are experts. For people that may be watching that are just curious about uranium and they're wondering how to get involved, how would you recommend, like what vehicles should they look at to kind of get started? Well, again, I honestly think the the work that, that new investors <laughs> into this space should be doing uh, should be on the sector itself, not on stock picking. Um, even though with what I just said, you you if you're not going to do that work and you're just going to buy uh, the cheapest stocks because you think they're cheap, some stocks are cheap for a reason. <clears throat> some some stocks are not. It really has to do with what the company has uh, has made. Uh, let's say ha has announced to the market what they have accomplished in the past years, the jurisdiction they're in, uh, et cetera, et cetera. There's a number of factors that we all look at with our process for choosing stocks, right? But I would suggest to anyone that wants to understand more. First of all, if you're not going to subscribe to our newsletter or uh, another newsletter that covers the space, there aren't that many, so it's not that difficult to find them um, and understand the fundamentals, then you have to uh, attend conferences like this. Read, read, read. There's some good blogs out there. Uh, Segra Capital Management puts out a fantastic blog. Um, John Quakes on Twitter is a veritable encyclopedia. Um, and there's a, a thriving Twitter, Twitter community for uranium. And if you just plug yourself in there and start asking questions, you're going to start accumulating some knowledge on the space. And that's, in my opinion, it's very, very hard to hold on to the sector because of the volatility and you have to understand it and you have to understand the fuel cycle in order to maintain conviction because it will shake you out. We've seen a lot, uh, a lot of shares change hands in the past few months, and there's been a decent amount of capitulation coming from retail. It's just how it is. It makes a market. It's, it's all good. But if you want to make a fundamental contrarian bet, you better understand what's getting you in and what will get you out. 
Justin, there's a question here from uh, we're live, which is nice. You know, and we, we got a we, we got a thriving uh, uh, a chat happening um, on the live stream. Uh, a question, a question from Frank. Justin, lots of turbulence uh, and uncertainty in Kazakhstan. Uh, recently announced leadership changes uh, at Kazatom Prom, uh, the largest uranium producer. Uh, can this impact supply cycle further? Reading tea leaves. Um, honestly, the change in management doesn't really give because uh, Adam promised shareholders the warm and fuzzies, but um, they're, they're, they're a bit of a black box uh, when it comes to the reasoning behind these management changes. It's been a bit of a, re of a revolving door at the company over the past few years. That's not really um, something that gives shareholders uh, confidence going forward, but they, they are and will remain the prominent producer in the world. Uh, the management change is probably unlikely to lead to a, a hiccup in production, you know, because Adam Prom, regardless of who's managing them, their production is so great that supply chain problems do, does affect them. They have highlighted that over the last few uh, quarterly conference calls. They're, they're having some issues around supply chains with sulfuric acid, et cetera. Um, uh, not necessarily labor problems, but that has happened to them in the past. It's, you know, it's, it's one of these sectors where that they're responsible for such a huge amount of production and they're about 40 to 45 percent of total global production closer to 50 percent this year um and when anything disrupts that production and it has and it probably will at some point going forward again that affects the sector and especially right now with uh with this market bifurcation and and because prom sort of in the middle they're still absolutely friendly to the west they're doing the best job they can in messaging to the West that they will remain a reliable producer, but they've had transportation issues. You know, they're, they're still shipping to the West, largely through the port of St. Petersburg in Russia. And uh, there's a number of entities that are not all that pleased with that. They are increasingly making deals with China and sending material East. It's possible to do swaps with Chinese inventory, but there's certain Western utilities that, um, that, uh, put a put a fine point on where the material comes from and so are not necessarily happy about doing swaps it's a it's an interesting area geopolitically hard to say what happens going forward but i think that uh if anything there certainly is a geopolitical risk discount applied to the stock and i think that going forward friendlier jurisdictions uh, are going to be more uh, favorable to the western utilities Got it. J Justin, thank you so much. Uh, always a wealth of information. That's Uranium Insider. If you guys don't know, uh, if you're if you're if you're Uranium curious, it's UraniumInsider.com. Uh, he's one of the great resources in the in the industry. Thank you, Justin. It's my pleasure. Take care, guys. Appreciate you having me on. Take care. All right, Uranium 101 keeps rolling. Grab that energy bar. We're not going to stop. <laughs> we got the operators coming up next. We're going to hear from the guys actually doing it in the field. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back with the CEO of Anfield Energy. Grizzle one-on-one -on -one uranium, let's go. So we're joined by Corey Diaz. He's the founder and CEO of Anfield Energy. Corey, welcome to the show. Thanks very much. Great to be here. So Corey, I want to start off with a big picture question. So what's the opportunity you see for U.S. uranium operators given the current geopolitical tensions and renewed investment in non-fossil fuel energy sources? Well, like I think it's uh, I think it's important to note that the U.S. has the largest installed base of nuclear reactors in the world, 
And yet the supply of uranium, you know, produced in the U.S. is essentially zero. And so the U.S. is dependent on you know, foreign actors in order to get material flowing into the sector. So you know, countries like Kazakhstan and Russia play a prominent part in uh, material coming into the U.S. So there's, there's significant geopolitical risk associated with those countries, especially given the war. You know, supply chains are broken down through COVID and the war in Ukraine. Uh, I think it's important to note that you know, Kazakhstan, you know, a lot of material that comes through Kazakhstan to the U.S. would generally go through Russia for conversion and enrichment. And given the relationship between the West and Russia today, conversion and enrichment isn't something that's likely being used by utilities uh, in the U.S. So, um, you know, I think it's a it's it's an interesting position to be in now as a U.S. producer or near producer, uh, because uh, U.S. utilities are going to be looking for other suppliers of material. Um, and certainly we are in the position to replace some, not all of the material that would flow out of Kazakhstan, um, but certainly we are in a much better position than we've been uh, in the past you know, three or five years. So Corey, I wanted to ask you, if, if you had to handicap it, or do you think the industry is at all prepared if the West was to put sanctions on uh, Russian uranium processing or anything like that? Is that basically off everyone's radar at this point? I think it has to be. I think, you know, part of one of the issues is that over the years, Russia has become, uh, you know, a dominant player in conversion and enrichment. And uh, Kazakhstan obviously has been, you know, one of the largest producers of uranium uh, for some time. So we've got risk not only related to uh, conversion and enrichment, but also production. We also have China stepping into the breach and starting to take supply from Kazakhstan, which means some of the material that would flow from uh, Kazakhstan to the West is now flowing east. We also see Cameco supplying you know, China nuclear with materials. So we're seeing that China is you know, the dominant player when it comes to uh, uranium uh, demand. And so that means that the, the supply is shrinking to such a point that uh, you know, there's a significant risk that you won't be able to secure significant long-term contracts. So the West knows it's just not feasible at this point to really crack down on, on Russian supply and processing. Absolutely. So, the, you know, in, in North America and the West, they're looking to restart, you know, conversions such as Comberdine starting up in 2023. You've got uh, Urenco uh, looking to increase its enrichment capacity, uh, but it's going to take time. And certainly, um, you know, it's going to take a few years in order to meet whatever capacity is going to be, uh, you know, turned down from Russia uh, in order to um, you know, kind of get things stable again. Got it. So I, I want to move on to, to Anfield. Can you, you guys have a unique kind of hub and spoke model for in simple language for people who may be new to the space. Could you explain that a little bit more? Sure. So, you know, essentially we have a hub, which is uh, what we call the Shipman <coughs> Mill, which is one of only three licensed, permitted and constructed conventional uranium mills in the U.S. And the spokes represented are represented by our significant projects. So we've got the Velvetwood Mine in Utah. We've got the West Slope project in Colorado, and we recently acquired the Slick Rock project also in Colorado. And, you know, in combination, that's roughly 30 million pounds of uranium and over 100 million pounds of vanadium. So you, you have a unique business model where you do have uh, vanadium assets as well as uranium. Could you help us understand what does the future of Anfield look like? How much of your revenue would you ideally like to come from, you know, uranium versus vanadium? Well, like I, th I think it's important to note that, you know, our uh, Velvet Word project in Utah is a uranium mine with some vanadium in it. But when we look at West Slope and Slick Rock, those are actually vanadium mines with uranium in it because the ratio is roughly five parts vanadium to one part uranium. And so going forward, our expectation is that uranium will be the dominant revenue source for us because we'd expect to see uh, uranium prices in the triple digits in the you know, relative near term. And the way that vanadium is priced in the market, uh, if you get above, call it $20 per pound, all of a sudden a whole bunch of new supply comes online because there are giant mines that supply vanadium, which aren't uranium related, and that will kind of put a cap on the price. And so if it's in that $10 to $15 band, then you know we can continue to produce uranium and, uranium and vanadium and not affect the larger market when it comes to kind of you know companies that are looking to uh, strengthen steel through the vanadium process. So our aim is to have a, a uranium dominant revenue driven business. Yes, it sounds like as good stewards of capital, you wait for a price response on either of those to make investment decisions, you know, to decide what that split would look like. 
Yeah, but I think either way, it, at this point, it's not really relevant uh, in terms of what the split will be. What's more important to us now is the general macro environment and the trend of the uranium price. So we are, you know, in a production uh, go forward position at this point in time. So we're moving straight, you know, full steam ahead uh, to get the mill up and running in order to start producing. Gotcha. All right. I, I have a slide I want to throw up that just has some of your assets so people can understand where you're, you're located. Could you tell us how you decided on these particular properties when you're putting them together? Kind of let us get in your head a little bit. Sure, sure. So look, you know, we've been involved in uranium, you know, since 2013. And, you know, our idea was that, you know, it's an unloved sector, you know, an unloved commodity, and it's a great time to start acquiring assets in a low price environment. So our first transaction was with Uranium One, uh, which is owned by Ross Adam, which is a Russian state owned entity. And at that time, we acquired the Shootering Canyon Mill, along with the Frank M mine, the Finley Tank mine, uh, and the Velvet Wood mine. Uh, and then in 2016, we did a second transaction with Uranium One, whereby we acquired assets in Wyoming, which are ISR or in situ recovery assets. Um, and alongside that acquisition, we actually signed a resin capture and processing agreement with Uranium One to use its existing facility, processing facility in Wyoming. And then in 2018, we acquired uh, the Westlope property and an asset called the Charlie ISR property in Wyoming uh, from Cotter Corporation. And then in 2022, we actually swapped all of our Wyoming ISR properties for the Slick Rock property. Uh, we did a, a transaction with UEC. And so ultimately what our aim was, was to get conventional assets which could flow through our mill. And so as we acquired assets along the way, we always had the optionality uh, embedded to say whether or not we're going to move forward with uh, processing, you know, using ISR through a third party or ultimately focusing on our own hard rock opportunity. And so when we did the last swap, we actually acquired an additional 70 million pounds of vanadium. So it actually helped us accelerate the opportunity on the vanadium side of the business too. Now this mill sounds important, just so I don't butcher the name. Can you tell me how to pronounce the name of the mill? It's tutoring. 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 Yes. All right, good. I'm happy I checked. So <laughs> on, uh, as we're talking about the shootering mill, what are the remaining steps, whether it's regulatory or operational, and, and your expected timeline for when you'd like to um, have that start operation? Well, like our, our hope um, for the mill is that we're up and running by 2024. And so we recently uh, signed an agreement um, or engaged uh, precision systems engineering uh, to put together a reactivation plan for the mill. And so part of that reactivation plan for the mill included the identification of which parts of the mill itself, which parts of the equipment need to be replaced or refurbished. Uh, they're also de designing a vanadium circuit for the mill. The mill doesn't have a vanadium circuit currently, but given the endowment that we have when it comes to vanadium over 100 million pounds, it makes sense to have a processing uh, circuit on the mill in order to capture that material. Uh, thirdly, uh, precision systems engineering is uh, very strong on procurement, so that will it'll help us with getting the equipment that's required to be replaced and identifying those parties who can refurbish the other parts that we don't need to replace. And then finally, it's critical to point out that this is the last engineering study required prior to us physically refurbishing the mill and, and preparing it for restart. So, uh, you know, once we've got the agreement and once we've got this report done, and that'll be uh, by Q2 of 2023, uh, we're in a position to move forward to reverse the mill with the aim to start production uh, in 2024. Just for people who aren't really familiar with the whole process of, of getting a mill back up or you know having a mine permitted, is it mainly is permitting the main hurdle that draws out timelines? It's not operational, you know, building the thing or, or refurbishing it. Yeah, it's it's regulatory. Um, you know, the sector is highly regulated, as I'm sure you can understand why. Uh, but certainly for our, from our perspective, we have a lot of the permits already in place. Uh, one of the things that we do as Anfield is we identify projects which are already advanced. We don't do greenfield projects. We're not an exploration company. We bought a mill which is already in existence and had previously run. Uh, we buy assets which have historic resource, current resource, uh, or past production. Uh, so we don't have to go through the hurdles of trying to uh, you know, start from scratch and build our way up because we want to operate in the current uranium cycle. Uh, so we have a lot of the permits that are required already in place. The mill itself has a radioactive material license. 
It's on standby. We're just looking to move it from standby to operational. Uh, we've got permits in place for uh, West Slope and for uh, Velvet Wood. Uh, so those are ready to go. We'll be ready to go by the time the mill is ready uh, to start accepting material. Great. So on that note, maybe could you help investors just walk us through what the upcoming catalysts are that they should look for over the next year or so? Sure. So, you know, one thing that we just mentioned is the fact that we have this uh, reactivation plan coming down the pipe from uh, Precision Systems Engineering. I think that's going to be a significant uh, catalyst for the company, really understand, you know, kind of what the costs are and how we're going to get the material that's required for the mill uh, to be put together and restarted. Uh, we're also putting out a uh, preliminary economic assessment for Velvet Wood. We had one that was out in 2016, but it didn't capture any of the vanadium that's uh, you know present at Velvet Wood. We know that there's vanadium there because production, past production showed 4 million pounds of uranium and 5 million pounds of vanadium. We're also looking at a PEA for uh, the four products on which we have uh, a resource at Westlow. Westlow comprised of nine mines. Uh, we put out a resource related to four of those and we're adding economics in early 2023. Uh, we may look to package both uh, the West Slope mines with the Velvetwood mine to create an even more uh, global resource um, and, and economics. And so that'll be a significant catalyst in early 2023. And then later on in 2023, we'll look to put out uh, economics and a resource related to Slick Rock. So we've got a lot of uh, resource related and economics related needs to be coming down the pipeline. And, uh, you know, just to show everybody that you know, there's significant value in uh, in the company, despite the fact that we're trading at uh, a significant discount to our peers. So as we just think about the uh, uranium price that that would be required to like make all this viable, what's kind of the range that you're looking for that would make it kind of a no brainer to, you know, bring the mill on and, and any additional assets? Well, we turn the mill on today if it were ready. Um, you know, I think the important thing too, is that we've got, as I mentioned, vanadium mines uh, with uranium in them. So the vanadium content in that mine adds significant value to the ore, you know, especially when you're transporting and certainly serves as the potential, um, you know, an off an offset when it comes to expensing material. For example, if we're looking at rock, you know, if we're looking at $50 uranium and $10 vanadium, that's essentially, you know, $100 per pound, right, as opposed to just 50 with the uranium. So having that balance allows us to move forward on the mill much more quickly than waiting for a higher price environment. Gotcha. Well, Corey, this has been a great conversation. I know there's a lot more to dig into on Anfield, but uh, it definitely piqued our interest. So we'll be watching you guys closely. So thanks for being on Uranium One on One. Well, thanks for your time. I appreciate it. Happy to come back. Thanks a lot, Corey. Come All right. That was back. Corey Diaz, CEO of Anfield Energy. Don't go anywhere because we're coming right back up with the CEO, Corey Bellick of Can Alaska Uranium. Back to back, Corey's. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs>
All right, Uranium one on one. Welcome back, everyone. The train keeps rolling. It's powered by nuclear energy. Yeah. Oh, man. Incredible. You so back to back Corey's. Hey, Corey, how are you? Can Alaska Uranium? Oh, I'm great, guys. Yeah, it's so great to follow the other Corey. Uh, I haven't seen him in a while. It's good to see him. And uh, hey, guys. I got my Can Alaska hats looking very oh, cool. That's, like, a, that's a, yeah. hey, listen, I missed you at the Red Cloud Conference, and which is a great conference, and, and so we miss you on that one. I'm glad you could join us for this one. Yeah, thanks, guys. It's a great pleasure to be here. It's uh, I almost didn't make it, as you know, but I'm here. We're talking. Oh, I know. I know. Hey, hey, listen, I sound ru- more rough than you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I sound like who, who, I <laughs> who isn't sick. Everyone, everyone watching knows there's something going around. Whatever it is. Oh. But now, now, Corey, let's kick it off, and maybe you could give us a brief overview of your assets and operations to help people, you know, put it all together. Yeah, no, that's great. Well, we're we're a junior explorer focused in the Athabasca Basin, and and we've got some great projects uh, over three hundred thousand hectares in the Athabasca. That's Saudi Arabia uranium, and you know we uh, we really pride ourselves on picking up those great assets in the Athabasca, and moving them forward toward discovery. And I'm sure we'll talk about that in a few moments. But um, we've got an incredible set of uh, set of assets in the basin. We've also developed a great nickel portfolio. We're not here to talk about that today, but uh, nobody wanted to have these conversations for ten years, and uh, what do you do for shareholders? So we developed a district scale nickel portfolio in Manitoba. So um, we're one of those junior explorers that deploys that hybrid project generator and explorer model. And I think to great success. Great. Now you have some great slides in your deck. So I did want to focus on it, uh, talking about small scale nuclear power. So my question is, does the US have commercial projects coming? And can you give us your opinion on the potential of small scale nuclear to you know, change the economics, but also public opinion about nuclear? Well, I think it's going to be a game changer for SMR technology being rolled out into civilian use, because, you know, I think in the U.S., if you just look at uh, new scale, I believe, uh, out of around Idaho, um, are sort of moving through the process of getting their first SMR sort of out the gate. And I believe it's 2029. Uh, at least in demonstration phase. So that is moving forward. And, you know, I think in the U.S. in particular, um, it'll open up incredible jurisdictions that haven't had access to those large scale nuclear projects historically. And I really do believe it's going to be a game changer. And that's backed up by what's happening in Canada and and the slides you reference. um, You know, for instance, the Darlington plant in Ontario, which is traditionally a large reactor complex, is putting in 300 megawatts of SMR technology. And that decision from that decision point through to build and first power is six years. That's virtually unheard of in the nuclear space historically. So um, it's incredible. And that's going to supply clean energy, SMR technology energy for 300,000 Ontario homes. And then in Saskatoon, these Evinci's, these are five megawatt tiny reactors. They're the size of a large van. Uh, it's going into Saskatoon in a consortium between Westinghouse and the SRC, one of the local research groups. So this will be generating clean electricity again by 2028. This is not fantasy. This is reality. And this is this old nuclear technology from, you know, the, the warships in the U.S., for instance, now being deployed to civilian use. And that is a game changer. Yeah, it that's good. That, that's... Jurisdictions. It opens up jurisdictions that can't support the big reactors. So, so could that be an opportunity, like just like like that that smaller one there, like let's say for hospitals, except like there there's a plethora of uses for that kind of stuff, right? Uh, absolutely, there there is because it, it could be hospitals, it could be you know it could be um, mines. Uh, right. You know, I'm hearing about it mine mining operations that want to go down the ESG beneficial path, if you want to call it that. Um, they're talking about supplementing what's historically the coal or gas fired energy with a on-site small modular reactor. And that is just incredible discussions that are happening. And it's real. It's not fantasy. And, um, you know. Well, and and also just yes. just versus diesel, right? Like, that's Absolutely. a huge. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it is huge. It's a game changer. And, and that's just getting going. But what I want to, what I really want to emphasize is two years ago, the conversation was, oh, yeah, it's fantasy. You know, when's that going to happen? It's happening by 2030. And we have to do it today in order to reach the goals of 2050, where if you if you go to the WNA in September, where I went, and you listen to the director general talk, and she goes, you have to start today to build out at least two times your nuclear fleet, possibly four times your nuclear fleet, in order to reach the goals of society by 2050, cleaning up the environment, cheap, affordable, base load electricity. That has to happen now. It's starting to happen this is one of the tools we have at our disposal that's real and now. 
Man, the outlook on nuclear just keeps getting better because, you know, you have a public opinion shift going on now, even and then you have this coming right after that. It seems like all the kind of balls are are, are falling. I'm, I'm ru- ruining the saying, but uh, everything's falling. Everything's into falling place. into place. <laughs> yes, all the yeah, blocks yeah. are falling into place, whatever it is. Yeah. <laughs> you are so right. Everything is falling into place. I think one of the last pieces to actually to actually come yet is that the politics has to get on board and fully just go, we need to do this now. We cannot wait. It's a tool we have. We're doing it because it's better for society globally, not just regionally, globally. And I believe that shift is coming. It started and it's going to be something special, I believe, in the next 20, 30 years. Now, let's move back to Canalaska. So tell us about your West MacArthur property and drill program and kind of a history of the assets. And I was very interested to see your relationship with the industry giant Cameco. Oh, well, do I have an hour? <laughs> well, the, the West MacArthur it depends project. what you want to do with your time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the West MacArthur project is truly special. And, and I will just open by saying it is the newest high grade uranium discovery in the Athabasca Basin. Now, Vision Energy might debate that, but I'm very happy for them having their success recently. That's great for Dev. But I just want to say that West MacArthur is special. We um, we have a long history there. Um, it was developed really in the last cycle for Ken Alaska. Uh, when I was with Cameco, which I was with Cameco for almost 25 years, um, I did the deal with from the Cameco side to get Cameco involved in the project because of what was happening at the nearby Fox Lake deposit of Cameco's. And that's a 70 million pound, 8% average grade uh, mineralized zone right near the property boundary. So that effort about seven years ago brought in Cameco, uh, did the first work, made the discovery of our 42 zone, and then uh, and then we got back operatorship. Yeah, 42 zone. And then uh, this year we looked at a, the, ge- the old geophysics and went, look, we can we can refine this with new technology. So we went in, committed to doing new geophysics along that C10 South corridor, and um, we repositioned the target. Our very first hole in the summer on that 15 kilometer stretch of reposition target intersected nine meters of 2.4% uranium. Now we're recalling the pike zone. There isn't another hole along that entire corridor, except for 42 zone, where we have 8% uranium um, already that that has intersected this target. We followed it up through the summer with additional holes and we drilled up to 25% uranium at the pike zone. So this is truly an evolving high grade target that we haven't even touched the ideal target of the unconformity on. So that's going to be the focus in three weeks, maybe four weeks time, second week of January, when we get back here with two drills, two drills to move the pike zone forward and really see what we have in our hands, because this has all the indications, the fingerprints, the fingerprints of one of these tier one mineralizing events in the eastern Athabasca. And one of the keys here is it's in the eastern Athabasca basin. And we need to really focus on that concept because that is the place to be around all that infrastructure, all those three mills all the mines, everything you need to put one of these into production, uh, it's going to have a home if it's a tier one asset. And then what, what about uh, Cameco? What's their role in this in the in your property? So Cameco, uh, as I said, joined joined the project, uh, did some work, earned into it. Uh, they're a twenty, a little over twenty percent uh, shareholder in the project right now, co-funding joint venture. So they've earned in. They're co-funding are choosing not to, it's dilutive if they don't. And, uh, and we're moving that project forward as a, as a, as a joint venture. And they're a great partner. I mean, I, I spent a lot of my career at Cameco as had my vice president, uh, my current vice president. So, you know, they are a great team. Uh, we, uh, we discuss ideas. We talk about the technical aspects. We talk about what we see in the rocks, what it might mean and uh, all to the betterment of the project moving forward. So it's a real strong partnership to have. And, you know, ultimately in Eastern Athabasca, Cameco and its assets, they have a need to feed those mills. So um, we have a partner that is going to have a need. That's great. Now, I want to move to another opportunity, which is kind of the supply depletion in the area um, at the nearby mills. So can you explain what's going on to our audience and how this is an opportunity for Can Alaska? Oh, yeah, this is an incredible opportunity for Can Alaska and, and its partner Cameco in particular, because um, but um, just in terms of Can Alaska, you have three mills in eastern Athabasca. You've got the Rabbit Lake Mill, which is sitting idle, has been for many years because it doesn't have a source of feed. You've got a Randall's McLean Lake Mill, which uh, takes the Cigar Lake ore um, currently. Well, that mine has about six, seven years of mine life left and it shuts down. That mill will be shut down post Cigar Lake in about seven years. Then you've got the Key Lake uh, mill, 
complex uh, right near MacArthur River. And MacArthur River is just restarting. And when they restart, they've got about 15 years of mine life left, and that's it. So there's no more reserve. So imagine a world in the uranium space where you've got 20% of global uranium production coming offline coming offline within 15 years. Now that sounds like a long time, but if we find a MacArthur River today at West MacArthur, which is what we think we might be onto, it will be at least 15 years to production. There is already a problem in the Eastern Athabasca whereby those mills do not have a source of tier one feed. There's tier two deposits, but they need a much higher price of uranium in order to come into production. So whatever we can find that looks tier one, like Cigar MacArthur, like we think we have, um, that, automatically has a home, it displaces all the other assets. And I will say that in the last cycle, the deposits that were found and the sales that happened in the Eastern Athabasca of those deposits generated much higher returns for the shareholders in the junior space. They were valued at about eight to $9 a pound in the ground, in the ground for the resource versus in the West where you might expect something around three or $4 a pound oh. in the ground. So wow. there's an automatic uptick because of that infrastructure and because of the need of that infrastructure for these deposits. So that's really the strategic opportunity for Ken Alaska and shareholders is to feed in, into that infrastructure with anything that we can find that looks to be tier one. Mm-hmm. Corey, I got a question. We got a very active um, YouTube. So you bring, that's, a, that's a power of life from Frank. Corey, with your uranium asset potentially becoming the next major find uh, in the basin, would you consider spinning off the nickel asset? Any interest? Absolutely. Let me be clear. We're a uranium explorer. Nickel was a hobby, a great hobby, when no one wanted to have this conversation about uranium. So we are looking to find ways to monetize it, and a spin-out is one option available to us. We've developed a district scale nickel portfolio that is second to none. You cannot step into a sulfide nickel belt like the Thompson nickel belt, the fifth largest on the planet with a district scale portfolio with mineralization on it. That's ripe for the picking. It hasn't been explored in 40 years. So we're waiting for the right partnership spin out. Absolutely. Let it float by itself. It is a company maker portfolio. Great question. Now, before we run out of time, I wanted you to take us through what would you say are the key catalysts for you guys over the next year or so that investors who are new to the story should be looking for? Yeah, key catalysts uh, is West MacArthur. Let's 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 be clear. I mean, the Pike Zone, it's brand new. It's a few months old. We're drilling high-grade mineralization over the right widths. It's got the right character, the alteration associated with it. The rocks, they smell. They smell like that high-grade uranium, which I'm so familiar with. Spoken like a true explorer. Smells like uh, Brussels, steamed Brussels sprouts. It is diagnostic when you're around that high grade. So Pike Zone is the focus. We've got a $10 million program plan for the Pike Zone area, immediate area around that. We're going to move that forward for our shareholders. Uh, it's approved through the joint venture, and we're looking forward to getting at it in the second week of January. Now, we've also got a second project that we're tackling um, down around the Key Lake Mill, which, again, needs feed in about 15 years. Uh, it's a brand new project for us, has all the right indications, um, the key extension project, and it, it looks exactly like what you'd want to see for an arrow Eagle Point type analog just outside the basin margin. So never been drilled, brand new targets, brilliant targets. They look perfect out of the gate. So we're going to drill that again in Q1. So we've got a lot of news flow coming with three drills on the ground in Q1, pre-PDAC, rip roaring, ready to go. And uh, and that's not even including our work with Basin Energy, who's a new entrant into the basin for us. We generate some projects. Here's the project generator model. We generate some projects and turn that project generation to a $15 million Australian deal to move three of those projects forward. Literally cost us $100,000, turned it into a $15 million um, opportunity for our shareholders to to move toward discovery, to de-risk those projects toward discovery. So we're just getting on the ground there. That's going to provide a lot of news flow for us. And stay tuned for that nickel story because I'm hoping to do something with that in next year as well. So you guys don't have much time to recover after New Year's, I guess. Going to get started <laughs> early. Hey, we're not even, you know, it, it's just the party's just going. Go, go, yeah. go. I mean, there is no, we, we are ready to go. We're fully funded and the team is just itching. They don't even want to take a break, to be honest. Uh, and neither do I, because it is that special what we're on to at Pike Zone at West MacArthur. And uh, they cannot wait to get back on the ground with the right drilling setup to actually tackle this target and move it forward for our shareholders. Because, uh, again, guys, it looks right. And uh, I've been in this business 30 years, and um, this one feels special. 
Hey, Corey, thank you so much. That was, great. that was a great interview. Uh, look forward to doing it up again soon. Uh, that's Corey from Can Alaska Uranium. And uh, yeah, we'll be back. Thanks, guys. If I bring a hat for you, can I have a grizzle hat? Of course. Yes, of you course. can, sir. Yeah. All right, everyone, don't go anywhere. We got Fission 3 coming up next. Welcome back to Grizzle Uranium One on One. We're joined by the chairman of Encore Energy, William Sheriff. William, thanks for being with us. Hey, good to see you guys. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining. So, first, can you talk briefly about the history of Encore and your asset footprint, both you know geographically and geologically? Sure, sure. Um, Encore is uh, really a, a second generation, if you will, of Energy Metals Corp, which was a very successful uh, company in the 04 to 08 uh, time frame during the uh, quote, last uranium round. And uh, after being a bit of time selling out there to uranium one and going on their board for uh, for a couple of years, took a number of the people that had uh, come with me and uh, we left to start Encore. Uh, unfortunately, our timing uh, on that wasn't particularly good or it was depending how you look at it. It was about a month before Fukushima. So uh, we had about a decade to plan our strategy, which uh, is paying off big dividends now. Uh, we were able to keep the team together and enhance it. Uh, our focus is 100% in situ recovery in the U.S. Uh, we're not looking anywhere else. We're not going anywhere else. The U.S. is the world's largest country uh, in terms of uh, consuming nuclear power. Uh, we, we produce essentially zero, have the capacity to produce uh, most of our needs, but just don't right now, largely a function of, pr of pricing and uh, having had uh, dirt cheap Russian imports for a number of years. Uh, but we've got uh, a pipeline of production assets, starting with uh, Texas, where we've got uh, three of the only uh, 11 licensed ISR plants in the U.S. Uh, these are three. Uh, this is uh, pro forma looking, uh, includes the deal we just announced with the Energy Fuels, uh, purchasing the Alta Mesa. It hadn't closed yet, but uh, we know it will, so we'll, we'll call it as good as ours. We, we still have to pay for it. I guess that's a small problem, but uh, uh, we, we've uh, just, just concluded a, a major $69 million bought deal, so that's not an issue. It's just a matter of having got the papers to closing yet. So we have three of the only 10 uh, licensed processing plants uh, in the U.S., along with the, the deepest staff of uh, experts in terms of ISR uh, technology, uh, you know, including even one of the two inventors of the process some 40 years ago. So from the board uh, through management down right into the uh, 30 or so workforce we have in the field, which is growing almost on a daily, certainly a weekly basis, 
Uh, we're ready to hit the road and be in production. We have contracts lined up. Uh, that first production comes mid uh, mid next year into the second quarter. Uh, it has a very steady growth profile over the next five years. Uh, we'll be hitting uh, roughly 3 million pounds a year in three years in Texas. Um, first one, of course, comes on at Rosita. Uh, then uh, that uh, that's a hub-and-spoke arrangement where the initial production comes from on-site, and then we'll be feeding it from remote locations uh, within a 50- or 60-mile radius of, of the plant. And then uh, in uh, a, a year, maybe just a hair under a year, Alta Mesa will kick into gear, and that's that's really the big project down there. It's got two million year, uh, two million pound a year capacity, uh, fully licensed. Uh, we've been doing a bit of sprucing up on that during the first part of next year, and then uh, uh, drilling a well field and turning on the tap, so to speak. So uh, should should be well on on the way to our uh, goal of three million a year in three years. So you did mention there's been cheap imports, and that's kind of been the status quo for a long time. Do you think there's an opportunity, given what's going on around the globe, to for U.S. domestic North American supply to kind of replace some of that? You know, it will. And I, I think you know, if you look through the history of the uranium market, the, probably at least half of the time that there's been a uranium market, there's been a premium on North American. In fact, for years, there were two, two distinct prices. Uh, free, free or Western world uranium price was much higher than uh, Soviet bloc. Uh, pricing. And I wouldn't be a bit surprised to see uh, that sort of thing, even if not uh, in a factual separate pricing, but uh, in a de facto pricing mechanism. And the domestic utilities are going to pay a little bit more for domestic certainty of supply. You know, right now we're 21 uh, percent uh, reliant upon Russia for imports, which, uh, as, you, as you're probably aware, is a bit problematic at the moment. Yeah. No, so I wanted to look a little bit at um, at the, the pricing environment. So um, kind of what are your thoughts on on what are your expectations of the uranium pricing environment when you're putting, you know, when you're trying to permit new projects and put money behind new projects? Are you looking to say, you know, where we are today, I'm going to make sure it works, maybe even lower? Or do you have expectations that the prices should be higher based on everything, you know, all the recent catalysts? Kind of what are you thinking? Um, yeah, a couple of things. Yeah, we've, we've had an incredibly good uh, or fortunate track record of calling the price going back to uh, 1999. And uh, at least members of our team, primarily uh, Mark Beliza, has had great insight on, on the pricing. Uh, the one thing we didn't see was the Sprott uh, Trust come in, which uh, was a very positive disruptor, soaking up so much of that uh, spot overhang. Um, so that 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 changed it. But you know, we aren't one that's looking for. Well, we're well, well aware of the situations exist to deliver us another spike, like we've seen in the past with uranium. Our, our company's built upon a more steady, uh, say, 8 to 10 percent increase in demand and, and pricing uh, over the next decade. Uh, we do think we're in the best environment for it since pre Three Mile Island. Uh, that is, we're in a sustainable uh, uh, operation here, a time frame, multi decade, uh, that we see the price will move on up, uh, you know, within certainly by the end of the decade, getting close to 100. Uh, now, that's just if you remove any geopolitical spikes that uh, might come or arguably even are, are very likely to come. But investors need to be really, really aware of the fact that, uh, you know, if an event happens in the world, it doesn't reflect itself in the uranium price tomorrow. It reflects it in the uranium price somewhere in the next two years. The, the fuel cycle is so different. In oil, if something happens, you see it in the oil market instantly. Uh, but the, the time frame is so different. It takes uh, two to two and a half years from the time we produce a, a pound of yellow cake until it actually goes in the reactor. And all these nuclear fuel companies, all the, all the nuclear utilities, they contract for multiple years ahead so that there isn't an immediate shock reaction uh, in their ability to deliver electricity to the consumer. So uh, that's probably one of the biggest single things if I could leave investors with it is understanding that time delay is yes, it is baked in there. Even now the uh, slowdown in, in product coming through St. Petersburg, Russia, which is the only outward, uh, Western outward uh, outlet for a Kazakh uranium, uh, all goes through the port of St. Petersburg. Uh, it, uh, you know, it slowed down. There's only a handful of carriers that can take nuclear material anyway. And then with the, uh, with the war zone, it's, uh, it's even greatly more reduced. So while it hasn't dried up, it's slowed down. That slowdown's baked into the nuclear fuel cycle, and you will see it over the course of the next year, year and a half. And I think there was a great deal of disappointment in the market that uh, when the slowdown happened, nothing happened in the uranium price. And, uh, but it's really quite, quite normal because it's not an instantaneous reaction. So that's something people have to get used to. And, Requires a bit of patience, but uh, once the cake's baked, it uh, it does show up. Yeah, I think that's the biggest piece of learning for investors that may be in another sector, another commodity, and then they come into uranium. It does help to understand that for sure. Absolutely. Lots of uh, different nuances in uranium. 
Yeah. So now can you talk to us a little bit more about your recent Alta Mesa, Alta Mesa transaction? Um, it looks to be kind of the most near term production source. So can you tell us why did you buy it and what's the plan for the assets? You mentioned that a little bit earlier, but maybe expand. Well, like uh, like most resource companies, it's a whole lot uh, less expensive to go and buy resources than it is to find them. Uh, exploration per se is not something that's urgently needed in the uranium business. It's expertise, it's people, it's, uh, it's the be- being able to permit uh, operate, extract, and market your commodity. Uh, that's where the real shortage is, and that's because we've only had three or four uh, really good one to three year periods in the last 50 years for uranium. The rest of the time, it's been a buyer's market. Uh, so what we're missing is uh, a whole couple of generations of talent in the field. And so that's your real scarce commodity, and we've, we've gone out of our way to recruit a top-notch staff and, and incentivize them to keep them and are constantly growing it. Um, but Alta Mesa specifically is, is a very large project. We like Texas as a base of operation. Uh, the two states in the U.S. are Texas and Wyoming that are agreement states uh, that have in situ recovery. Agreement status is pretty important because it basically means the federal government's removed. The NRC is uh, take N- Nuclear Regulatory Commission has ceded their regulatory authority to the state level, which makes permitting much, much easier, much, much quicker, much uh, less expensive. Uh, Same regulations, just you're doing one window permitting instead of dealing with two. And and the states, they have an economic incentive to see you in production, whereas the Fed, eh, they don't really care. You know, it's it's a little slower. So, uh, you know, they may they may care, but they move a lot slower than the states. So being in Texas is great. Our cost of production is just right off the top, about five to seven dollars, maybe even eight dollars a pound less than in Wyoming. Uh, The further up, further north you go in terms of in situ, the worse uh, the price, just because in Texas, we don't have to bury any of our plumbing. You know, we, we drill in in situ recovery. We don't have open pits. We don't have underground, which also leads to quick permitting because there's not nearly the environmental consideration. Uh, we can also re- reclaim projects much quicker by virtue of uh, the less invasive uh, technology to recover. In fact, we aren't really even a mining company. We're much more akin to an oil and gas company. We, we just produce our product as a metallic uh, commodity. Uh, but Texas is great. We keep our plumbing on top of the surface. It doesn't freeze. Uh, that in itself saves us that uh, extra price of having to insulate everything and bury all the pipelines and everything underground. And, and also on the back end, when we reclaim, we just roll them up and, and pick them up. We don't uh, have to dig them back out of the ground and, and replace the, the, the ground cover. So uh, it's a cl- great place to be. It'll be our second one in production. The Rosita plant actually will be the first one. And like I say, it's com- commissioned for, uh, we've fully renovated the mill there. Uh, we spent about a year and that came in on time and on budget with about a three month delay for six pumps uh, due to uh, supply chain, but it's ready to go. Uh, it's been tested now. Uh, the well field at Rosita is uh, approach, approaching 85% in, uh, and it will be ready to go uh, by the by the end of the second quarter. So initial production from Rosita followed within about, about six months or less with startup at the second plant, uh, the much bigger plant at Alta Mesa. And the real driving factor for us, aside from the licensed production facility, which is obviously a huge leap in in terms of uh, CapEx and permitting, is the uh, huge land package. It comes with 200,000 acres of private land in the state of Texas, right smack in the middle of the uranium belt. So, you know, in addition to the roughly 20 million pounds that are known there now, which will feed the plant for, you know, a decade, uh, there's tremendous exploration excitement there. We've got 50 uh, miles of roll front identified with fence drilling that... uh, is proving up so far at about a million pounds uh, a mile, which is uh, what you're expecting. So, uh, you know, it could be, we have full expectation that it'll be quite an exciting uh, project for many decades and, and will provide the, the initial boost of growth to the company. Uh, that combined with processing out of Rosita, having two operating facilities, uh, being first to market, I think gives us a, a huge advantage. Yeah, thank you for having a slide like that. It's so helpful to put in perspective of kind of the timeline for for Catalyst for for everyone. Now, yeah, I just want to ask you. Projects coming in there too, because after Texas, then we move on to Dewey Burdock in South Dakota with a million pounds a year. That's in uh, about three or four years, and then a year after that is uh, uh, our Wyoming Gas Hills project in 2026 at another million pounds. So, it's like I say, we're fully dedicated to the production pipeline. Gotcha. Now, did you say in your deck that your your CEO, Paul, he previously operated the Alta Mesa assets? Is that true? That's correct. He uh, just a little bit of background on Paul. He was president uh, of Cameco Resources in charge of all the Cameco's ISR operations uh, worldwide. And uh, he built uh, the last three of these ISR plants in, in the States and operated them. So uh, he knows them inside and out. He uh, built uh, 
uh, Alta Mesa for a private company at the time. It was the ranch owners that actually went into business there. Uh, and uh, yeah, I built the thing in 11 or 12 months, came in under budget and in production, was one of the few people actually selling into that big spike you saw back in 06, 07. And uh, sold, sold uranium from Alta Mesa as high as $135 a pound at the time. So, you know, his knowledge and the, and the rest of the team, most of our team's got 30 to 40 years experience. So, uh, you know, that, that sort of experience is invaluable when you're starting up, especially multiple operations. Now, uh, there's one other slide that I wanted to show because it's a good one. It's just kind of on the on the uh, nuclear, the process. So sure. um, would you ever move down the value chain from where you are now? Or is in situ and yellow cake production kind of your sweet spot, would you say? You know, the team's built to be in situ. And, you know, what you see on the left there is the uh, fuel chain. Uh, we basically uh, get our commodity at the end of the brown and orange. That's when we get paid. That's when we're done with our end of the fuel chain. Uh, we produce yellow cake, uh, which is U three oh eight. It's uh, you know at about 0.7 percent U two thirty five, which is the fissionable product. We then transport that to the conversion facility in Metropolis, uh, Illinois. There it uh, is converted into uh, uranium hexafluoride gas. From there, it goes to the enrichment plant, where it's uh, spun through centrifuges to concentrate the U two thirty five up to about five percent. When they start going to HALU, it'll be uh, up to about twenty percent. Uh, and then that goes to fabrication plant and then ultimately to the power plant. And that's why it takes two to two and a half years for our uranium to get into a reactor. Looking at the chart on the right, you can see that until the uh, Cold War was over, the U.S. was uh, almost entirely self-sufficient with their production in green. And then uh, once uh, cooling off came with uh, the former Soviet Union, Russia in particular, Kazakhstan, uh, the uh, the imports have essentially been you know 100 uh, percent or close to 100 percent of the U.S. Uh, need. And uh, like many things, when you uh, rely on outside countries uh, that are seemingly friendly, uh, you don't know how long that's going to last. And that puts you in a very vulnerable position, but a, a very compelling position for Encore. We've, as I say, custom built or tailored this for in situ. We've, we've collected uh, more than our fair share of experts on it. Uh, first mover advantage on uh, getting, like I say, 30% of the plants in the country that are licensed and ready to go. And uh, so I think we've got a pretty good head start. And, Look forward to uh, being the first new producer in the U.S. Uh, second quarter next year. Very exciting. Wow. Well, William, thanks so much for being with us. This is really interesting. I know there's a lot more to unpack, but at least some of those slides, if anyone wants to check out their investor deck, some great slides on there explaining the Encore, uh, the future of, of Encore Energy. So thank you for being with us. Yeah, well, that was Absolutely. fantastic. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you, guys. It'll be an exciting time to be in the business. 100%. Definitely is. All right, everyone, don't go anywhere. We're going to come right back. We're going to be joined by Dev Randwall, Rand, Randawa. He's chairman and CEO of Fission 3. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to Uranium One on One. We're joined by Dev Rendawa. He's the chairman of Fission Three. Dev, thanks for joining us. Hey, it's my pleasure. All right, so Dev, you have a great slide in your deck. I wanted to put this up first, um, laying out the current landscape for nuclear. Can you walk us through why construction activity is at a twenty-five year high globally? Well, I think it's because you know, um, one, I think China for some time now woke up. I mean, I don't know if you've been to Beijing at all in the last uh, since the Olympics. It got clean during the Olympics because they shut down almost all the manufacturing that back up. You can't even see if you're in a hotel, another hotel. So 
So they're doing that a necessity. Um, since I've been the business since 1996, um, the first time I remember a Democratic Party, for example, is pro. And the Greens now are realizing that, um, that believing that solar energy and wind energy uh, are like, kind of like the unicorn. Not sure they're not going to serve all of us. Okay. Um, I, I just don't, I, I think like we felt we left the house of fossil fuels and tried to move to renewable house and it wasn't ready. And as a result today, Germany, 50% of his energy comes from coal and ignite, you know, and, uh, even in, you know, California, the Germany of the United States, you know, they've asked people not to charge their electric cars yet. They want to go to electric cars. So I think there's a reality check that's come in. Um, in my view, that's why I think you're seeing, you know, planned economies been doing it for a long time. And now, uh, countries that were saying, uh, to buy votes, uh, like Japan and Korea, they're now having to build reactors again, forget about starting them back up. So it's, a, it's just, we need energy and there's a big energy crisis. Just go to, uh, ask people in London, how they're, what their electrical bills are like. <laughs> yeah. Nothing like a good energy crisis to show you the benefits of nuclear, right? You got it. Yeah. So maybe you could take investors quickly through your corporate history of Fission 3. You have a long history in the uranium market, and I have a good chart for that um, while, you're, while you're chatting with us. Yeah. You know, bottom line is this. If you owned a share of Strathmore Minerals in 2007, you look in your account today, you would have four pretty active companies. You would have a share of energy fuels. You'd own something in fission uh, uranium, and you would own something in Denison Mines, and finally Fission 3.0. So think of it. What other company out there has a group of a group of management team have said, here, we're starting with one. Oh, boom, you've got four companies now in your portfolio. So I think that's important. Track record, I've always said, and nobody cares. Nobody listens. I get it because we, <laughs> we, we listen. Momentum is... We've been screaming in the environment, in the Iranian business, don't trust one source, anything, right? You don't trust Russia, but guess what? Germany did it. And even the United States here, um, how silly, right? Um, Trump may be crazy in a lot of ways, but he called everybody out and says to Germany in person. And he said, don't trust Russia. What does your history book say? And people laughed at him because nobody cares about the map. And I've said for many times, if you, number one thing in a junior company operation, in the exploration, especially is management, management, management. And people don't get it. They go with the shiniest thing. And <coughs> you know, what have they done for investors? What have they done for investors? Have they made money or just the insiders made money? Okay. So this is a key thing about what we've tried to do <coughs> is we made a discovery. We had two U.S. and Canada. Peter Groskopf, who set up Sput, told took us public in Fission Energy, and right after that, we were able to get a joint venture with the Korean Electric Power Company. They funded all exploration, made a discovery, sold that to Denison. We put 100 grand in. That sold for 85 million. We then took the western side um, of the project. Den uh, Lucas and the group took the eastern side went there where nobody said there was any uranium. There's no uranium there. But guess what? We use a very innovative approach to fly the area uh, with a high <coughs> resolution on boulders. Boulders became uh, fission uranium's triple R. Um, there would be no arrow today if we don't fly that. There's no triple R. There's nothing until people thought differently. And that's what Ray and Ross did. They had some experience in the diamond business from choppers picking up garnets, indicator minerals, right? <coughs> And it worked. So, um, you know, that's what it comes down to. Um, so when you do find a properties, we have been very careful uh, about the things you got to look for before you drill. The Athabasca is fairly cheap to do these kind of geophysics um, and geological surveys, but drilling is expensive. So whenever we look at our properties, we always make sure we tick the boxes before we go. So that's what we've done. So our track record is pretty substantial. Um, our technical team has found the J zone, which became, uh, it was sold to Lucas. So they made a discovery, built a deposit, sold it. Right now, 
Here's your uranium led by Ross as the CEO. Um, we had a discovery, moved to 150 million pounds. And finally, <coughs> excuse me, it's become, you know, a six, seven hundred million dollar company. We took all those exploration assets and started our own uh, uh, a group called Fission 3.0. We, maybe we should have thought before. But that's what we did. No, I like it because then you can go four, five, just keep on rolling. <laughs> well, and we can. Look, now, I'm also just, right now, with all due respect, uh, guys like Rick um, and, um, you know, other guys, uh, the everybody else can tell you the story better about nuclear. They can tell you that the Athabasca is amazing. But what really matters is can you find a high-grade deposit? And that's what I really want to talk about is that, you know, yep. about three weeks uh, we probably announced the best discovery hole in decades. When you compare it to what um, Arrow was, the first hole, what uh, happened at ISO, what happened at Triple R, our discovery hole was the only one, the highest counts per second they had to that point were 15,000. Uh, we went, hit 65, okay? And now you have to be careful. Every centilometer is only collaborated to itself. So it's not... Um, not the same as the one that ISO would use. So you got to be careful. But when we used ours before, it was a 50% uranium. So we know somewhere between 20 and 70% uranium in that piece. So we made a pretty good discovery on PLN. Um, we're obviously very excited. The stock has uh, roughly gone up 400%. We raised $8 million a bond deal last week, uh, led by Red Cloud, Sprott. Again, Peter Groskopf is there. And... Mm -hmm. Uh, some smart cookies with Mr. Campbell and group over at Haywood, uh, Collins, the analyst. So, you know, uh, we're thankful that Dave Talbot caught the story early and Bruce and the guys have raised the money. So we're super pumped because between not Christmas, we should, according to the assay labs, get that assay where you've got massive black pitch pen uh, uranium there. And then we drill three more. Um, we just put three more follow up holes that hit. So we've got four holes now into this, which is super exciting. <clears throat> now, when you first begin with a discovery, you only step out about 10 to 15 meters at a time in different directions, right? Um, and that's what you do. So we're doing the exact same approach we did at Waterbury, which we've done at on the Triple R. You slowly, as you learn the, what Ray will call the attitude or the geometry, I mean, yeah. what fluids are forcing this up? Okay, mm -hmm. this conductor is very long. And on the property map, you'll see it sits mm -hmm. above and below our uh, pure point, next gen. This is uranium, they're right below. Um, <clears throat> so this is a, a map on the inside on the right. You can see the, um, the three major projects are being, look how much land we have to work with. The road that goes right in the middle of the property is good for 365 days of the year. That's how exciting it is. And the other one with the green line, that's a conductor. Um, and the discovery is near the top. <coughs> All our, and um, we knew there was uranium in the area because we call it smoke when you get little bits and pieces. So now we have four holes. All of them have counts per second over 60, I think 63,000 um, seconds. Four holes. So we are pretty pumped about the assays that are coming. Um, that's going to be between now and um, uh, hopefully uh, end of January. Um, but again, labs promise. We'll see what happens. So that's what's got us. Dev, could you help us um, just under like take this uh, take the pieces apart? How many assays are you, are you waiting on? How many wells well results are there that you're waiting on? We've um, four holes have hit. Four holes have hit um, the discovery. We, we made a discovery. Stepped out 10 meters up dip, then we went down dip around 20 meters, and then back up dip. Um, so we've got, when I say up dip, not up on the property, just on the discovery moving up that way, closer to the sandstone. So we've got two really beautiful, one, our discovery hole, two beautiful holes um, up dip, and one below it. They're all about 10. Um, so right now, I would say our area is around 30 to 40 meters by 30, 40 meters. It's small, and really what we need is assays to come out. Um, 
but we'll have, according to the labs, they weren't too busy. And they said two to three weeks. So hopefully we'll get them um, next week. Um, but you know what? Look, not trying to be difficult here, but all the uranium stocks are going to go up when uranium prices go up. And, mm -hmm. But I don't, I don't think they're going up because anytime soon until the general markets get it together. Okay. Because the general markets are holding down spot. That's been the reason why uranium is shot. If Peter Groskopf, being a genius he is, goes out there, raises 300 million, raises a billion. And by the time he's done, they bought 50, 60 million pounds, right? We need them back in. And also, like um, Bill Sheriff said earlier, what happens on the other end is a two year gap, okay? So these super high prices on, you know, enriched uranium is going to take time to find it back here. It's not like, well, you know, there's a, uh, you know, bunch of, there's a hurricane and wipes out X amount of production. It doesn't happen that way in our business. Um, there's a gap. So all these other stocks, you know, and there's a, look, uh, you've got some great CEOs here. Bill's done a super job. Uh, and with Paul, uh, you know, and I, and I obviously, you know, Lee and the boys have done great. All these stocks will go up. Okay. But we don't need uranium to go up. We don't need um, uranium prices to go up. We've got our own story that's based on asset and it, it doesn't need, you know, we're at 400% on four holes with scintillometer results. We'll get those. So if people want to be in uranium and they want to say, okay, do I need to, do I need to wait um, until uranium prices go up? Because as that uranium, um, ocean goes up, all the boats go up. We know that. Okay. In fact, listen, we were at 28, 29 cents. Okay. Last year. And we had no discovery. That's the, the mania of the, of this uranium market There's very few names, you know, um, it's like a big elephant falling into a very small pool. You know, yeah. <laughs> well, well, Dev, you, you know what? We, we got to have you back on. Uh, it's, it, you know, we got a great group of companies and Vision 3.0 story is incredible. And I thank Thanks. you so much for, for joining. We'll, 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 we'll definitely have when we, we got to have you on the in the rotation right. for uranium one on ones going forward. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks for Dev, having thank us. On. Appreciate Just it. Thank you. Thanks for bringing this out. I think we need more groups like you guys out there telling the uranium story because most people really don't understand it. And what you're doing is educating people. And when they educate it, they'll buy more. Yeah. We're, we're big believers in the education. All right, everyone. That, that was Dev Rendawa of Fission 3.0. Don't go anywhere because we got the man Rick Rule coming up next. Coming up. Let's go. <laughs>
Okay. For your young audience, the 70s was the most outrageous natural resource bull market probably in humankind. Uh, and I benefited from that. I actually started in the oil and gas business, but I had the good opportunity to participate in many natural resource markets. Um, precious metals business treated me well, and I have uh, developed a reputation in precious metals because I've been a full-time friend, which is to say I have invested in precious metals during bear markets and hence profited in bull markets. And I've done the same to the best that I could in many other commodities. I was very early on, <laughs> too early, in fact, uh, in the last uranium bull market. Uh, I began to invest very heavily in uranium in 1998, and it didn't do very much until 2002, which is to say I was rewarded by my genius uh, for four years of dead money. Uh, by the end of that bull market, I had uh, developed a really good reputation. But people forget that for the first four years of that bull market, I was regarded as somebody who wasted money because I was in a sector that had no adherence uh, and hadn't moved. Uh, I will tell you, however, that if I've learned anything in natural resource-based businesses, it is that you are either a contrarian or you are going to be a victim. We, you buy sectors like uranium, like gold, like oil and gas, when people hate them. Uh, and when your genius, if that's what it is, becomes evident, you sell them. Uh, remember the last uranium bull market. At the beginning of the bull market, there were five junior companies looking for uranium. There were probably 15 management teams industry-wide that understood something about uranium. That meant that the probability you had a good management team was a function of dividing the participants, five, by the managers, 15, pretty good odds. By the end of the bull market, there were 500 companies purporting to look for uranium, uh, which meant that you divided the number of participants, 500, by the number of managers, 15, an ugly number, or pardon me, the other way around, an ugly, ugly, ugly number. Bear markets are for buying, bull markets are for selling. Don't let your listeners forget that. <laughs> That's that's some that's a great piece yeah, of advice. Great advice right? a, a, a commodity veteran. That's you know that it's the sell part that's hard, right? Not for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you've early, you've been through early, enough uh, rodeos, huh? Early in my career, I hung on too long. Uh, in the end of the decade of the nineteen seventies, when that bubble burst, uh, I was sort of a believer in the idiocy of Malthusianism and the Club of Rome. Uh, and I hung on too long and went from being a, a very rich young man, uh, hubris ridden, by the way, to a somewhat more humble uh, young man with a negative net worth. That only happened. <laughs> that only had to happen to me once before I learned that when the narrative began to be justified by the price action, the narrative was no longer valuable, which is to say that when a com commodity goes from favorable to red hot, don't have any fear of missing out with regards to higher prices. You make the money when you take the money. And that will come to uranium. I've been there before. Uh, you will, you'll be in a period where even your mistakes double. And when you are in that situation, if you don't take money out, you're basically stealing from your family. Mm. Right. That's wise words. Those are some, those really wise words. And, uh, you know, Rick, obviously, you know, would love to hear what you're doing uh, with Rural Investment Media. Just, you know, we, we, you know, what what's what's happening with your your new chapter? Well, I don't know, uh, to be honest with you. Uh, I decided to retire from regulated businesses. So I ceased active employment from Sprott, although I'm still their largest shareholder. I'm still a director and I suspect I'm still their largest client. Uh, the prospect of retirement didn't sit very well with me. Uh, too much of my sense of self-worth uh, involves business. And what has really interested me is what you're doing, education. So Rural Investment Media right now is merely a database of 80,000 people who like to listen to me talk about natural resource investing. <clears throat> I have absolutely no idea, frankly, how I'm going to monetize it. Uh, I do know that last year I did a uranium boot camp. Uh, I had anticipated, well, I had hoped to sell a thousand tickets and I sold 3,205, uh, which told me that people are willing to pay for high quality education. Yes. And my hope is that I can use my 50 years of industry contacts 
to bring very, very, very high quality education to people around natural resources uh, and, and manage to make uh, a little bit of money uh, and enjoy a lot of amusement in the process. <laughs> you may know, and I'll say this at the beginning of the interview, that I am delighted for any uh, attendees uh, in this symposium, the Grizzle Symposium, any of them who care to go to my website, ruleinvestmentmedia.com, uh, and list their natural resource stocks, I personally will rank them for free on a no obligation basis. And I'll comment individually on issues where I think <laughs> that my comments might have value. One of the things I'm doing is rather than advertise, I'm trying to give people a benefit. Uh, I'm trying to increase their knowledge about natural resources by talking about things that are of real interest to them, which is say their own portfolios. Hey, hey uh, Rick, so, so I actually went on the website. I, I, so all of it's fascinating and, and, and you're, you're disrupting and, you know, you're trying new things and seeing, you know, seeing where you see where the game goes. Uh, so how does that, is that a quantitative process where you rank their stocks or how does that work? Or is that your kind of internal ratings? Uh, it is definitely an internal rating and, and it reflects my own value system. A lot of it is in fact quantitative. Uh, many people who look at mining stocks, in particular junior mining stocks, forget that they're supposed to be able to make money. Uh, so a lot of it is quantitative. Uh, we have some tools where we can screen CDAR and EDGAR databases for balance sheet uh, and income statement activities. But then you have to get in the weeds. Uh, you have to look at the development pipeline. You have to look at the geology of pre-production companies. You have to look at preliminary economic assessments, pre-feasibility studies, feasibility studies. Uh, and I also, uh, as a consequence of being in the business for 50 years, uh, pay real attention to management's track records over time and the opinion that people who I trust have of the management team. That part of it is qualitative. Uh, if a company is controlled by people I've done business with and know and love for a long time, like the Lundines, they basically automatically get a point uh, because uh, I believe that results don't conformably align among a population. There are serial overachievers and serial underachievers. And one of the things I've been able to do in 50 years in the business is identify the people who you'd like to do business with and the people who really you'd like to shoot. Uh, <laughs> and hanging out with the people that you'd like to do business with and hopefully restraining yourself from shooting the others uh, is one of the things that goes into the rankings. And, and for those who, so where I found this was ruleinvestmentmedia.com for those listening in uh, to the Grizzle Uranium 101. Uh, fantastic. And, you know, and thank you for the background here, Rick. That's, it sounds very exciting. Uh, I've had a lot of fun with it. And I, I hope I can benefit uh, others the same way that uh, people have benefited me. I mean, in truth, much of what I do now comes as a consequence of the debt that I feel I owe two mentors that I enjoyed when I was a very young man. Uh, I had the extraordinary good fortune to run into people like Peter Kundal, the Dean of Deep Value Investing, uh, Peter Brown, the founder of Canaccord, who was very useful to me as a young man, Ned Goodman, uh, who was ridiculously useful to me, his former partner, Seymour Schulich. I had extraordinary mentors when I was a young man. And to the extent that I didn't attempt to pay it forward, I think that it would be disingenuous with regards to the debt that I owe the memory of those fine mentors. Incredible, incredible luminaries, right? That's, a, that's an incredible list right there. And us young guns, we appreciate it because I know good mentors have made a big difference for me in my life and, and bad mentors, uh, the, the opposite. So I, I definitely appreciate uh, what you're doing for the industry. <laughs> yeah, I had some of those too. <laughs> yeah. Everyone does, yep. <laughs> Um, so Rick, just on this, you know, I think you, you, when you started, you gave us a great overview, like, you know, you gotta be, you gotta be, you gotta know when to sell. Right. And so clearly right now in uranium, where are we in the, in the cycle? So, you know, where are we in the process here? How, to, how should, uh, uranium investors take a look at this, uh, market and how, where, where should they be putting capital? Listen, with the caveat that something that is inevitable isn't eminent which is to say that investors need to steal themselves for the fact that the inevitable may take two years or three years. 
uh, and that you will definitely have to stomach lots of volatility. I see the uranium business as an absolute no brainer. Uh, I see it as a no brainer, not because of the narrative. I don't care about the narrative. You can't buy coffee with narrative. But the arithmetic is stupidly, stupidly, stupidly good. It is estimated by people smarter than I that the fully loaded cost worldwide to produce a pound of uranium is about 60 US dollars. That's not the AISC, that's the total cost. It includes the cost of capital. It includes, importantly, amortization of prior year write downs. Uh, it includes social rent, which is to say taxes and royalties. So the industry makes the stuff for 60 bucks a pound and they sell it for 48 bucks a pound, losing $12 a pound 130 million times a year. Uh, what that means is that the industry is still in slow motion liquidation, which is why nothing is getting built and why great big projects like Inkai are still shut in. That, however, disguises the fact that the utility of uranium is fantastic. Even in countries that believe that they're too rich to need uranium, like that great debtor, the United States, 13% uh, of electricity supply in the United States comes from uranium. 20% of baseload supply in the United States comes from uranium. The truth is, if the uranium price doesn't go up enough to cover the cost of capital, the lights will go out. So think for yourself, which outcome is more likely? Will the lights go out or will the uranium price go up? I think this is an absolute no-brainer. For some reason, uh, when people look at a circumstance in that simplistic fashion, they think that the fact that it has to happen means it has to happen now. That isn't true. You need to adjust your time frames. It isn't the time frame that's convenient to you. You need to adjust your mind to the time frame that is required to enjoy the reward that's implied by the arithmetic. And by the way, when I say $60 a pound, that's the incentive price for current production. Uh, it is estimated by people who are smarter than I, which is to say the middle management at Kaz Adamprom, that the incentive price for new production, new project development worldwide, is about 75 US dollars per pound. So when I am valuing uh, Uranium Junior based on, say, a preliminary economic assessment, I run a three-tiered pricing model, one at $50 a pound. Mm -hmm. At $50 a pound, they're almost all overvalued. Then I run it at $60 a pound, which looks surprisingly more attractive. And then I run it at $75 a pound. And at $75 a pound, obviously I see value. You need to discount that back on a net present value basis and assume that the project doesn't go into production for five years or seven years. But if you are willing to accept the pricing scenarios that would be required to keep the lights on globally, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, 12 or 15 companies come into real focus. I would caution your audience, there are probably 75 Uranium Juniors worldwide. My suspicion is not more than 15 of them currently have any value whatsoever. So when you talk about Uranium, you can't invest in the sector unless you buy SPUT, unless you buy the physical itself. You need to be very, very discriminating and you need to develop the skill set so that you can apply the criterion yourself rather than say having the investment banks who have uh, an interest in earning a commission from you apply criterion that might be less rigorous than you would imply that you would apply yourself rick just on that point between owning the physical and stocks which obviously you know your view is you know there's a select select group among this larger population how should an investor think about the 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 asset allocation between that as a uranium investor that depends on the investor uh the truth is that the market's irrelevant except as it relates to your needs and your risk tolerance the easiest thing to do is simply to buy the spud uh if you think that uranium is going to go up buy uranium uh don't buy it and store it in your basement that doesn't work as well as it does with gold <laughs> Uh, in fact, buy the SPUT, a very deep, very liquid vehicle. It is going to go up in price because uranium is going to go up in price. If you can afford to be a little more aggressive, if you can afford company risk uh, in search of outsized returns, I think the next place you go after SPUT is Cameco. 
the truth is that I think that there's going to be enough beta in the market, beta defined by me as the outperformance of uranium relative to the broad market, that many investors don't need to take the risk associated with the juniors. They can simply buy Cameco. If you have a sense of humor for implied political risk, the best uranium company in the world is Kazatomprom. Best in terms of margin, best in terms of pipeline, best in terms of production cost. Many investors don't like investing in a country they can't spell. And for them, Kazatom, uh, Kazakhstan and Kazatomprom becomes a problem. And then for those people who are looking for the kind of returns that I enjoyed in the 1998 to 2008 time frame, then you need to begin to do real risk. Then you need to do the juniors. And to do the juniors, you need to steal yourself, first of all, because you're going to be wrong on occasion, uh, and also because you're going to have to endure a lot of volatility. And the theme might take longer to come to fruition than you would like. But I'll share a little statistic with you just to fire your listeners' greed. At the beginning... <laughs> At the beginning of the last bull market uh, in, well, 2001 is when it really began. 1998 is when I got involved. I was a little early. <laughs> At the beginning of the exercise, there were five uranium juniors worldwide. Five. The worst performer in the stock market in the next five years ran 22 to 1, which is to say the worst part of the statistical sample gave a 22 to 1 return. Now, I wouldn't suggest to you that I held the whole basket for the whole period of time. I wouldn't suggest to you that I held Paladin from one penny to $10 because I didn't. But the truth is, if you scale out, uh, even getting part of that move, the part in the middle, not buying at the absolute bottom and selling at the absolute top, generated spectacular returns. But it also required a lot of work. By the end of that boom, I had probably personally spent 500 hours understanding uh, just Paladin. Wow. Wow. Incredible, incredible lesson right there. And, and um, just, and maybe I can also just get your, obviously it's uranium one-on-one, -on -one, uh, but also it, it would be a miss not to talk about precious metals and, and you know, all that, oh, all that is happening on that side and, and maybe even to throw away your th thoughts on Bitcoin, et cetera, but uh, we would love to get your thoughts on that side. Well, let's start with Bitcoin. You should throw away my thoughts because I don't know very much about it. <laughs> Uh, for some reason, and I think FTX is uh, illustrative of this, uh, people who have been successful in one endeavor, uh, for some reason, cause people to believe that they're good at other things. I've proven very conclusively that I'm not good at things outside of my own area of expertise. What FTX has done for me that's been, amu that's been very amusing has pointed out two things. First of all, the biggest institutional investors in the world don't do the requisite due diligence. They're coasting on a reputation gained over 40 years. How could a wonderful venture capital firm like Sequoia not understand that FTX was a $30, a $30 billion pool that didn't have anything in it? Any rudimentary due diligence would have uncovered that, but rudimentary due diligence wasn't done by the most reputable investors in the world. The second lesson is that your listeners, uh, maybe not your listeners, but the world at large, seems to assign value to the opinion about complex financial topics of basketball players and actresses. Why would you care what an actress thinks uh, about the financial outcome of a complex financial instrument? What is it about the background of a basketball player that makes you think that he or she might be able to understand the intricacies of a technology or the intricacies of a market. Uh, it, it is absolutely a mystery to me why anybody would care what a celebrity thought about anything other than the subject that caused them to become a celebrity. Uh, and, and I think that uh, FTX is illustrative of those two common mistakes that people make. But let's go back to precious metals, because there I do feel like I have some standing in the discussion. I'm a, a man that, if you looked at my portfolio rationally, shouldn't own gold. I'm the largest shareholder of Sprott. 
if the gold price does well, if the silver price does well, Sprott won't do well. It'll be, do extraordinarily well. But I have relatively large holdings of gold and silver anyway as an insurance policy. They help me sleep nights. Uh, and at age 69, you'll understand something about the importance of sleeping well, which you might not now. <laughs> I own a lot of gold, and I hope in my heart of hearts that the gold price does not go up. Gold is an insurance policy. It's an insurance policy uh, against a lack of faith. When I go to an investment conference and some guy's chortling about the fact that he thinks that gold's going to go to $10,000 an ounce, I ask them to consider the impact on their lifestyle of the set of circumstances that would cause gold to go to $10,000 an ounce. So although I own a lot of it, uh, and although I think in a reasonably short period of time, five years, six years, seven years, that the price of gold will at least have a two handle, if not a three handle. I hope I'm wrong. With regards to the precious metals equities, that's a different thing. They're businesses. I like investing in those businesses because I understand how to do it better than my competitors. I don't have to get it right. I just have to get it more right than other people. And I have to remember the basic discipline. Things are cheap when they're out of favor when people don't want to be in the precious metals space, when the precious metals miners are arguably statistically very cheap and nobody cares, when they don't go up, when they test people's patience, that's the best possible time to be in the space. It's weird that somebody will do a whole bunch of work on a company and think it's a good buy at 10 and buy it. And then the price goes down to seven. Nothing has changed with the company. And rather than buy more, because it's cheaper, they sell what they have because their their patience was tested. Uh, this is maybe the dumbest financial response on the planet. I think it stems from the fact that people pay a lot of attention to the price of their investments and no attention whatsoever to the value. Money is made on the delta between the price and the value. And if you don't have an opinion as to value, the price information is irrelevant. That's the only reason that I can assign to people's ongoing stupidity uh, with the way they handle their investments, particularly, of course, their precious metals investment. Uh, people's expectations of the future, which is to say their price expectations, are set necessarily by their experience in the immediate past. Uh, what that means is that increasing prices around a, a commodity act as psychological justification for the narrative. People don't buy the narrative until the price is performed. But ironically, after the price is performed, the narrative is worth less. Right. Uh, if the gold price were to go from 1700 to 3500 which is to say if the price doubled, uh, if the rest of the world hadn't changed much, gold would be precisely 50% less attractive. The price had doubled. The outlook was the same. Uh, and yet uh, there would probably be 10 times as many people trying to buy it after it had used up its move than before. Simply being on the backside of that trade, simply buying things when they're cheap and selling things when they've run is most of what people need to know about the whole range of natural resource investments. Rick, you'll, yes, you'll call, yes. let me let me do one more illustrative point. You yes, remember please, yes. the discussion <laughs> that I talked about the arithmetic around uranium. It's important to apply common sense in natural resource based businesses. Roll yourself back two and a half years to the COVID period. You had Prime Minister Trudeau and President Biden uh, and that noted energy physicist. What was her name? Greta Thornburg. Uh, all of them talking about the demise of oil and gas and the price of oil and gas got below 20 US dollars a barrel. In fact, it got below zero neglecting the fact that the world runs on oil. Uh, again, uh, you had a fully loaded cost worldwide to produce a barrel of oil for about 60 bucks. Either the price of oil would go up or the world would stop. Those were the two choices. Uh, you know, the idea that we were going to switch to alternatives right away was silly. The world has spent $4.6 trillion on alternative energy. And we have reduced the market share of oil and gas from 82% to 81%. So the idea that we could do without oil 
as a consequence of COVID and as a consequence of the wishes of the big thinkers was stupid. Uh, what you really had to do was understand that the price of oil had to go from 20 to 60. Uh, and that was really all you needed to know. Uh, and this situation repeats itself again and again and again. All you need to do most of the time is nothing. Uh, and all you need to do when all of a sudden the market is willing to hand you enormous amounts of money and all it requires from you is courage and faith, you should probably take that money. Rec so just here on the stream, we're getting incredible. You know, we're getting, uh, hearing excellent points. I can't get enough of Rick. What a legend. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's it's really is you, like you're it's a professor of investing. It's, it's great, uh, great insights, Rick. I can't wait to have you back on the show. And those that don't know, listen, um, go to uh, ruleinvestmentmedia.com. Um, yeah, can trader. These comments are gold. Great points. Uh, go to uh, uh, ruleinvestmentmedia.com. Uh, a, you got your portfolio side there, but also uh, teachings that you're doing. That I, I believe you said you did one for uranium and other commodities as they come up. Am I? Do I got that right? Yeah, we're in the process right now of doing something called the Rule Classroom, where we take various aspects of natural resource and mining investments, and we do hour-long presentations. We've done major mining companies. We've done the difference between alpha and beta. We just did one on the capital stack, which is to say the organization of capitalization within a company. Country, company, pardon me. This will be a 32-part series, and it's absolutely free at ruleinvestmentmedia.com. The other thing that I should talk about in passing for those of your listeners who are speculators is because I'm no longer securities licensed, I enjoy commercial freedom of speech. Uh, <laughs> I have, as a speculator, profited mightily in the last 40 years from private placements. And it used to be that in a general setting, I could never talk about private placements because it was regarded by the regulators as a, as a solicitation. Because I'm not compensated anymore, it's not a solicitation. So if you are an accredited investor, and if you're willing to take the risk uh, of private placements in pre-revenue stage exploration companies, uh, if you at Rule Investment Media in the question and comment section following rankings, write placement, I'll give you notification on a complimentary basis of every private placement I'm doing and why. That doesn't guarantee that you'll get in the private placement. Sometimes I get preferential access. It doesn't guarantee that you should be in the private placement just because I did it. But it costs you nothing to find out what I'm doing. Understand I'm extremely picky about private placements. So three months may go by without you getting a notification. That's because I haven't done anything. But if you are an accredited investor and you believe that you have the sophistication and can handle the risk and you want to know what I'm doing with my own money, whether or not I think you should, uh, in the question and comment section at Rule Investment Media, write placements. Rick, can't oh, thank you enough. Cool. This is this is it's been an incredible half an hour, and, and I can't wait to have you back on. And keep us posted. We'll be a megaphone for whatever you know, whatever is happening on the on the rural investment media side. It sounds like there's tons of learning and knowledge to be had. Thank you, Rick, so much. Yeah, thank you, Rick. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, may I wish you the best of the season and every possible success in the new year. Thanks thank very you. much. That's kind of you. All right, everyone, that was an amazing conversation. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back with David Talbot. He's head of research at Red Cloud Securities.
missing Doom Breaker. All right, everyone. Welcome back to Uranium One on One. I hope you didn't miss that last speaker. That was a doozy. Ooh, wow, yeah. Rick Rule in the house. Oh, you know what? That was kind of like that was that was a last minute addition to the schedule. And we got and those those that missed Doomberg, he's coming back. He had a, a little jury stint there that he uh, he had to get out of. And then uh, and uh, well, we we, it, we would be amiss not to talk about our partners. Can we throw that slide up? Yeah, we got to thank our <clears throat> partners here. So number one, we got uh, Red Cloud. Red Cloud. This a big part of this happening is because of Red Cloud Financial Services. Go go check them out. Uh, they're doing fantastic work. You, you can and you can get access to their research. It's yeah, it's actually for free. You just go to redcloudfs.com. <coughs> Redcloudfs. It's free research. It's a great resource. And next we got uh, Uranium Insider. So everyone on Twitter knows him. YouTube Baby <coughs> Two. He's a leading authority in uranium market news analysis and helping you identify the leading companies in the space. That's uraniuminsider.com. And then we have Grizzle Quantum Strategy Newsletter. This is our, our new newsletter. It's a take on analysis through a quantitative lens. It's with something we think is missing from Substack. So what's going to be in it? It's going to have stock picks, market analysis, and insights into how to put a <coughs> an industry specific portfolio together and an overall risk managed portfolio. And finally, Doomberg, uh, camp, you know, the legend, uh, fantastic team over there. Uh, they are the number one sub stack in the world, uh, in the finance category, an incredible achievement, uh, incredible work they put out. Uh, if you're not subscribed, subscribe. It, it, it's, it's like, the, you know, that's just an automatic, uh, Doomberg all right, everyone, we're going to be back in one second with David Talbot, head of Red Cloud Securities Research. All right, David Talbot, how are you? Welcome to Grizzle uh, Uranium 101. Hey guys, thanks for having me back. I, I think you're out to get me because I have the toughest people to follow. You know, last time it was a green talking chicken and this time it's Rick Rubin. <laughs> we got a lot of characters on uh, Uranium yeah, 101, that's well, for sure. Well, Dave, Dave you know, we, we, we put you behind legends, right? And so, Dave, uh, thank you for joining in. You know, uh, I was, I was, uh, I was at the, the wonderful uh, Red Cloud Conference, and those who who are, you guys do that twice a year, am I right? Um, it's a yeah, tour de force. It's incredible, uh, and that you know we we uh, Margo and myself attended. It was fantastic, uh, and you had a the I was in the uranium room, um, and it was it was a, a stacked agenda of of companies, and and the insights were incredible. I came out with a ton of uh, you know ton of knowledge on the sector. At a high level, Dave. Obviously, you guys are the shop, the go-to shop for uh, for mining insights and research. You're the head of research there. Talk to us high level. This is going to step away from uranium a bit, but the 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 key commodities you guys cover and and uh, and you know what your your particular views on on, on the landscape today. Yeah, so we, we essentially cover uh, a broad host of uh, commodities, whether it's gold or nickel or lithium or, uh, uh, you know, some of the other base metals that are essentially rebranding themselves as uh, battery metals, you know, the nickel coppers of the world. Uh, and then we are heavily focused on the uranium sector, as I have been since 2007 or so. You know, we've been working on 27, 28 uranium companies uh, in in right now um you know I, I i am managing director of the company and i do i do want to give a little bit of in, insight on who red cloud is because i still think that a lot of people out there don't know who we are because yeah. we are pretty young we've only been around for about uh, a little under three years on an iroc license side but it's probably closer to uh, let's say eight uh overall but uh, you know I, obviously i'm managing director head of research on the security side there's two parts we've got that iroc license boutique uh the typical sales trading banking uh research side of things uh and we are focused on mining and just mining as you said you know we're relatively new but since the beginning of 2020 we rank second in canada for the number of equity uh, brokered equity financings led or co-led in the mining space and i don't think a lot of people realize that 
The uh, sister company is uh, Red Cloud Financial Services. So, um, you know, that focuses more on the corporate side of things, uh, heavy media presence, uh, social media presence. We have Red Cloud TV, webinars, frequent events, branding, website design, videography, heavily invested in the uranium space. As I said, we were, we're picking up the battery metal space as well. So, so that's a little bit about Red Cloud. So. Fantastic, fantastic overview. Now, topic du jour, uranium. Uh, if I am a newbie, uh, new to the sector industry, uh, how should I come to the stocks and, and the companies operating in the space today? Well, you know, you've got uh, various ways to play. You can play in the physical and, you know, Sprott is probably, well, definitely is the leader in that, if not the leader across the board uh, in uranium investment. Uh, Cameco certainly is a leader on the producer side. Uh, you know, I keep in mind, I'm not, uh, I don't cover Cameco and uh, probably some of the other companies I will mention today. If I do cover them, I will, uh, I will make a note of that. Um, but you know, you, you can play in producers, you can play in developers, you can play in explorers and there's a range of explorers. They might have resources. They might not, uh, you know, uranium price is a large piece of the puzzle. So, you know, in, in the outlook for uranium price. So you've got to, first of all, decide, is this the sector I want to uh, play in? Do you want to have direct exposure on uranium? That is the other question. Uh, then other than that, you start looking at the companies and you you break down a uranium company or any other company uh, the same way, you know, look at the management team, look at the project. Is it a good project? Are they, are they in a good jurisdiction? Is it a good, uh, uh, do they have news flow coming out? You don't want to be in a good project that just doesn't say anything and tell people how good they are. So um, I think stage of projects a little bit less important for me from, uh, you know, as far as whether or not to choose to get into that story. I think the situation we're in right now, we need all the uranium we can get. So if it's exploration, then, you know, there are investors that look just for that. They're looking for either discoveries or they're looking for growth. Uh, if there's near-term production, there's investors for that as well. You know, price, uranium price movements should theoretically have more impact on near-term producers, but it doesn't always work like that. Sometimes you get a little bit momentum on the, on the smaller stories. Uh, you know the, uh, and, then, and that's where you can make some some real money in in event of uh, yeah. of discoveries. So, it would uh, Dave that would, fantastic overview there. Now, with respect to now getting into the meat and potatoes of this, uh, if if, you, if you're comfortable sharing, how do you, how do you what are your 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 your, your stocks you like um, across the spectrum uh, and and you know just some of your top picks. Yeah, so, um, you know, unlike Rick Rule, I don't have commercial free speech. So please bear with me because I do have to give some disclosures here. Uh, so one of, one of our top picks, uh, not represented today, but uh, is Global Atomic. We do have a buy $7 target price. This is an investment banking client of Red Cloud. But, uh, you know, the DASA project in Niger is in construction phase. They've broken ground on, on the underground ramp. They have potential to sell development or early on they continue to sign their uh, uranium sales contract. So long life, low cost, high grade production in, let's say, the five million pound per uh, per year range is anticipated from what we believe will be the highest grade mine outside of the Athabasca Basin. Um, as far as some of the companies that people are seeing today, I, I want to focus on some of them because they are pretty good companies. Of course, yeah, it, was, it was a great, great, great interviews with all of them. Good, good. So, you know, Encore, we, we heard from Bill earlier, you know, we've got to buy 825 target price on them. They are also a red, a red cloud banking client. But, you know, Encore is working hard to become a leader in the ISR space in the USA. They've got three processing processing plants in South Texas, plus development projects in, in South Dakota, Wyoming, and New Mexico. Uh, we expect them to resume production next year at Rosita, and uh, their guidance is, as you put on the screen there, 3 million pounds by 2025, 5 million pounds by 2027. So, you know, they, they can get back into production next year, and they're start, starting to sign contracts as well. 
Uh, another company, Anfield Energy, we saw Corey buy 25, solar, 25 cent target price on that one, and they're a banking client as well. But Anfield's doing a great job picking up com conventional uranium and vanadium resources and around its fully permitted Shootering Canyon mill in, uh, in Utah. And from this company, we expect further M&A, we expect further resource updates. We, we think they're uh, going to work on a study to figure out the cost and timing to refurbish that mill. So, you know, they're a company that can, uh, you know, looking out be realistically in production within, say, two or three years, uh, yep. depending on what they need to do to refurbish that mill. Uh, Can Alaska Uranium, another quarry. We've got a speculative buy there, no target price, another banking client of ours. Uh, they had a discovery in the summer uh, made on the West MacArthur JV, uh, with the, which is with Cameco. New discovery called the Pike Zone uh, hit about 2.5% over 9 meters, 3.5% half percent over six uh rock rock looks really really good it looks like the basement hosted stuff the Cameco is mining it was mining at the eagle point mine and Corey knows those deposits very very well so he's the right guy to uh, to follow up on this and they they just uh, you know they doubled their budget to about 10 million bucks per year so so those are the guys you had uh, uh present today uh i'm currently currently restricted on fission 3.0 red cloud is leading the equity deal so i can't comment on that one today Great rundown there, Dave. And and I got to ask you, final piece here, because, you know, we just got a sleeve here of your uranium insights. Uh, but could you talk to, because uh, there was a question here, um, just, you know, thoughts on comments on the lithium market, your broad takes on, on electric metals. That was also represented at the, at the wonderful uh, Red, Red Cloud Conference. Maybe uh, just, you know, if you could give us your high level takeaways there for, for investors in terms of, um, you know, what, what what commodities do you like there in, in uh you know uh, we, in terms of lithium nickel etc yeah, you know, I'm I'm still pretty passionate on the uh, on the lithium side. I've covered that sector since 2009. Uh, you know, I, I think we've seen really sharp price increase over the last couple of years, and that's uh, not without merit. I do think we're going to see not necessarily further price gaps upwards, but I think we could still see price pressure upwards, um, and that has really been incentivizing a lot of exploration, a lot of development in the space. But it's not necessarily easy. Uh, it, unlike uranium or gold or copper, where you're delivering product into a, a broader spot market, here you're delivering directly to the end user, and that end user needs to know exactly what's in your the product they're buying. It need to know the impurities and just make sure it's it works for their for their end use. You know whether it's batteries or something else. So um, you know ceramics, etc. So um, you know we do look. We we are pretty, fairly bullish on the DLE space you know i know that's been given a bad rap by some uh and others say it's not quite ready but you know it's leaps and bounds ahead of where it was even just 10 years ago uh you know i think getting rid of the impurities up front uh has no longer been the focus i think dle technology has expanded to the point where they can specifically strip out the ions that they're looking for, specifically the lithium, and uh, go from there. So, you know, still needs to be a, a little bit of work uh, at the uh, at the mine stage, but, you know, it is a technology that's been used uh, before, well, for, for a couple decades in lithium and for years and years in the uranium space as far as ISR is concerned. So, so we do like that, uh, you know, hard rock, uh, you know, five thousand bucks a ton uh, on costs of probably 500 bucks a ton. That's, that's a huge write up uh, markup on uh, on your hard rock assets if you're delivering spodumene, and which is probably a good way to go because it down it, it essentially takes the risk and puts the risk on others as far as converting it to lithium carbonate or lithium Dave, hydroxide. Uh, Dave, yep, sir. Go ahead. Don't go. Ahead. No, I, I was going to say, you know what we should do? Because obviously, you know, I, I want to, we, we've got to do is we, we got to do, yeah, you come back on a battery metals and, and, you know, like get the full, get the full makeup again. Uh, but, you know, great yeah. takes on, on, on the uranium sector, uh, how investors should play it. And again, for those that don't know, uh, at Red Cloud Securities, you can actually get access to the full research suite of Red Cloud. Dave, yeah, so that's redcloudfs.com is where you go for that. Exactly. Dave, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we'll obviously see you again soon. For sure. Okay, thanks for having me on, guys. Thanks, Dave.
All right, everyone. I hope you got your energy bars because we got the green chicken coming up next. <laughs> oh, oh uh, one thing, guys, uh, those on YouTube, we had a fantastic crowd here. If you haven't done already, it would be wonderful if you could just give it the thumbs up. Um, I know, you know, just, get, just get, give it that one thumbs up. Let other people know the wonderful guests that we've had here today. And, uh, you know, just... We're blessed to have Rick Rule, and now we got Doomberg coming right up. But uh, please hit that thumbs up. That'd be wonderful. And we'll be right back. Welcome back, Grizzle One on One <laughs> Uranium. Let's go! Oh, what a special week, Doomberg. Thank you for joining us. Hey guys, great to be here. Appreciate your flexibility today. You know, no, yeah, no, days, obviously, so. obviously, circumstances happen, and, and we're we're happy to accommodate. Um, you know what? We had you. We had you literally two days ago. I feel like I'm I'm at Doomberg HQ. We we should just have a live feed all the time. <laughs> Well, the technical term for it is the chicken coop, and you're always welcome. Oh, that's, uh, right. that's right. Both of you guys are welcome anytime. Um, drinks will be on Thank us. You. I feel like I'm turning green already. <laughs> yeah, <I'm> lucky <laughs> enough. Yeah. Uh, Scott, you would kick it off. Yeah, so, Doomberg, we got some big news on Fusion. Is it big news? Maybe can you kick it off? Give give us your thoughts. Or are you, are you, you have a piece in the works on this? What's yeah, going on? Yeah, so, so something's cooking. Yeah. So, hey, guys. Yeah. Um, obviously, we saw the fusion news and, you know, speaking at a uranium conference, it's hard to uh, not address the elephant in the room, so to speak. We do have a piece coming out probably later this afternoon over at um, doomberg.substack.com. Um, and the piece is called The Time for Choosing. And, you know, um, we are, uh, you know, I personally am a scientist by training and all four basic science. Um, but we're a little bearish on the fusion announcement, if we're being totally honest. I think um, ultimately, um, you know, the hype cycle that we're about to experience in fusion will probably do more harm to what we should already be doing, which is propagating nuclear fission. Um, the problems that fusion purports to solve, um, you know, lack of nuclear waste and, and zero risk of nuclear meltdown, those are largely fake problems. Um, the industry has long ago solved that, especially with the latest reactor designs. Um, nuclear waste is a canard. And so <clears throat> what we fear is the um, sort of environmental Malthusians who oppose nuclear energy because they are fundamentally anti-human will use the promise of fusion um, to further just further delay and obstruct the propagation of nuclear power. And then when the time comes where fusion is ready for commercial development, uh, they will then pivot and do everything in their power to make sure that fusion doesn't happen either. And so um, while we're excited by basic science and we're interested to read and we respect the scientists at, you know, um, at the at the national labs who've put this work out, um, ultimately, um, you 
put us in the bearish camp, camp on the on the consequence uh, and the significance of this uh, to, to humanity. So that's the overarching view of the piece that comes out hopefully later this afternoon. It's in final editing right now. And um, and so, yeah, that's our view on fusion. Yeah, for, for those listening, guys, um, the, the, always excited to, to, you know, when, it, you know, I, I think, Doomberg, you, you stated the best, right? Uh, the, uh, in one of your pieces, you know, that excitement when a Doomberg piece hits your inbox. But this one's going to be a special one. Uh, if you're not subscribed, do subscribe, doomberg.substack.com. And just, just kind of overlaying those comments there, you know, we had Chris Kiefer, uh, who, you echoed the sentiment, Doomer, okay, which, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it's taking, we, ha we already have a solution. Yeah, the piece is called A Time for Choosing for a reason, which is um, ultimately uh, abundant energy for as many humans as possible is a political problem, not a science problem. The science is solved. Um, yeah. We can today deploy carbon-free um, nuclear energy at scale with very safe technology um, in a way that um, does minimal damage to the environment. You know, there are no solutions. There are only trade-offs. So what trade-offs are you willing to make? And one of the trade-offs that environmental Malthusians are willing to make is having a lot less people on the planet. They don't say it that way, but, you know, a, a, as we say in the piece, like um, uh, a, physics dictates that a true implementation of their policies means a lot less of us um, being around, and, and we're not okay with that. And, um, and we do, like Chris Keeper's big fan of his, and I'm going to actually be on his podcast next week. Hopefully we've got something scheduled. Um, multiple time of, I, that I've appeared on his excellent podcast. Um, and, uh, you know, great guy, Canadians for Nuclear Energy. And, um, and, and like, like he says, like, th this is a solved problem. And um, the proof is uh, that this is a political problem is that we just um, obstruct, uh, you know, the classic move of the environmentalists is um, do everything in the power to make nuclear fission expensive. Lawsuits. Uh, absurd regulations, propaganda campaigns, pick your favorite, and then turn around and say we shouldn't do nuclear because it's too expensive. <laughs> They're playing both sides of the trade, right? And so, right. And, and I would say, and we're pretty hard on the industry here, um, this is a political war and we're losing. Like we've been routed. Like, it's, it's only recently that we've begin to, begun to see a turnaround because luckily for the industry, it is the only plausible solution to decarbonizing the economy that does not involve significant pain and suffering, starvation and death uh, at untold scale. And so they have physics in their corner, but from a pure political maneuvering, the industry has been routed by the Sierra Clubs of the world and the Friends of the Earth and so on. And, and, and the point of the piece this afternoon is to make that point and to try to get the message out like Kiefer is trying to do, um, that you know, we actually have to do a better job of selling ourselves um, because we do have physics on our side. And we do have humanity on our side. And uh, fusion, I'm afraid, um, however interesting and scientifically relevant the breakthrough announced by uh, Livermore National Labs might be, um, it's just going to feed into the hands of the, the political um, expertise of, of the environmental movement that has done an unbelievable job of, of minimizing nuclear energy, stopping its propagation, and in many uh, G7 and Western countries, uh, rolling back its deployment like we see in Germany and Belgium. So Doomberg, am I hearing you correctly that you're saying fusion is not the enemy of fission unless it's used for kind of public or political goals that right. would be uh, the enemy of, of fission? Yeah, fusion is fine. I'd be all for it. I mean, who would be against it? Um, the point is we don't really need it. It doesn't solve a real problem. The, the problems that um, the nuclear industry is held to account for are fake. They're fabricated. They're concocted uh, by the radical environmental movement. Uh, nuclear waste is a canard. Like we know how to safely handle nuclear waste in a way that um, means like basically nobody's ever going to get injured from it. And that's on one side of the scale. Yes, we have to handle nuclear waste. On the other side of the scale is, you know, gigawatt after gigawatt after gigawatt hour of carbon free power that is, um, you know, uh, providing unbelievable standards of living. Look at that. Ontario is basically powered by nuclear power um, with a bit of hydro. Um, there's no more coal being burned in Ontario. Um, France is 50, 60, 70 percent powered by uh, nuclear power, depending on how good they are at running their power plants. Um, and yet we see Germany, which rolled back its nuclear power, its number one source of primary energy for electricity so far in the fourth quarter is coal. Um, tell me how that's progress. It's not progress. Um, and so literally, um, fusion is great. We're all for it. Fusion as an excuse to stop what we should be doing today uh, is a poor one. And look, it's going to take decades for fusion to become commercially viable. And in those decades, we could be solving real problems and reducing carbon emissions. And moreover, as we wrote in the piece, 
um, as you'll read, hopefully. Um, once it comes time that fusion is viable, the, the same critics that have stopped fission are going to turn around and concoct fake problems with fusion. Like, don't kid yourself. They're not on your side. Like, um, they, will, they will be proponents of fusion so long as it helps them stop fission. And when it comes time for fusion to take over, it won't. They will, they will invent something like they invented the nuclear waste problem. Yeah, it's it's that classic. Don't look over here. You know, well, let's wait for something better, and it's going to come better. And meanwhile, they were, you know, the same the same groups are willing to put the current um, uh, energy. We're in this energy crisis because of these current groups, right? Pushing so much uh, variable power, not thinking about base loadage. It's just fascinating. And I just, I, I guess I want to ask Doomberg. On that point, in all that's happening in Europe, we, we've seen record uh, spot energy prices throughout Europe and in, in, more recently in the UK. Is this that moment where uh, you have these very well-organized groups where the public outcry is like, enough of this, like we we have a solution. Like, but to your point, we also need to, you know, we need groups like Canadians for Nuclear Energy. Like, I just try to think out what is the strategy going forward here? We, clearly, the the energy crisis in Europe can be used as a teachable moment, but how do we push that forward? So it's a great question. And uh, one of my concerns is, look, here's, here's the situation in Europe. Um, European leadership gambled on the weather. Um, they entered the winter of 2023, 2024, or 2022-2023 with, um, with basically the hopes that the weather would be warmer than, warmer than normal. And, and luckily, um, November was. Now we're starting to see a bit colder December and we're starting to see little weird data points in the market. Like, you know, they had electricity prices in the UK reaching sky high record prices and the uh, rate at which natural gas is being destored in Germany. Um, the slope of that curve down is pretty steep. Um, so they've gambled on the weather. And the worst outcome would be um, they get by and then they see that as a validation of their policy. Like you took a gamble, like you gambled your family, your family didn't die in a car accident, you probably shouldn't drive drunk again. You know, um, right. and, and so if they make it home and the cops don't arrest them and everybody's safe and you got nothing but a hangover the next morning, that doesn't mean you should go and get drunk again and put your family in the car, right? Like, so the European leaders of the EU have put their population at great risk. Um, the expected return of that damage is the probability of it happening times the consequences. If it doesn't happen, that expected return doesn't change. Um, but the worst case would be um, they get through the winter, they learn no lessons, they have to do it all over again next year, um, and the situation only gets worse. The ideal would be they get through the winter and they learn the lessons. <laughs> like we, We're not sitting here cheering for a cold snap to be proven right, uh, contrary to what many Twitter trolls might think. Um, we, would, we would like for our, good, our, our subscribers in Europe, uh, our many customers in Europe to get through the winter just fine. Um, yeah. But we would also like for them to have learned the lessons of risking the family in the backseat uh, for what they have done. Um, and so <clears throat> we shall see. Um, don't forget beyond coal. I mean, we've documented how Europe is burning trees from you know, the US Southeast and calling it carbon neutral. You, know, you, you couldn't make it up if you tried. And so all of this is occurring when one pellet of uranium is the equivalent energy of a, a ton of coal. Like, what are we doing? We have the answer. That's why the piece is called a time for choosing. That's why we're annoyed by the current fusion hype cycle. And by the way, as we point out in the piece, in order to drive the hype around fusion, they have to make an even bigger contrast to fission. So they have to play up nuclear waste and they have to play up nuclear meltdown risk in order to justify the tens of billions of dollars it will take to develop fusion. And so it's a double whammy in the sense like it, it, you are um, making a fake problem be perceived even worse for clicks. Like that's when you read the story in the Financial Times breaking the scoop, you know, limitless carbon free energy with no nuclear waste and zero risk of we, we have all that today. Yeah. Um, uranium is dirt cheap. Um, we could solve these problems today. It's a political problem, not a science problem. And, um, and the quicker we can all understand that, the better. <clears throat> and so to the extent that we and Chris Kiefer and other advocates with a bit of a social media following could do our best to sort of lean into the to the winds of propaganda from the environmentalists. It is a losing battle, to be totally frank. Like we, as big as our social media footprint might be, it pales in comparison to the complete and total grip on traditional media that environmentalists have. But we have to do it. You have to keep fighting um, because physics is on our side, and it is the pro-human stance, and we proudly take it.
Well, you know, yeah, it's very well said, Duberg. And the one thing that I've seen, at least, you know, I know it's you know feels brick by brick, but it, it social media I feel has has been a great equalizer. Obviously, you know, you've got a phenomenal platform, and it's just. You know, people are seeking out the truth, right? And in times like this, where energy prices are spiking, and it's hitting pocketbooks. It's it, coming back to uh, a key, like key uh, statement for for Doomberg, Energy is life, and wh- why should anyone have to take, a, you know, a lower? Uh, you, why do I have to sacrifice my quality of life when we can have it? When we can have it all? Well, you'll see in the piece. We open the piece with a story. Our good friend uh, Emmett Penny, who is a pro nuclear advocate and an excellent author of. Um, a really great free newsletter called Grid Brief, um, gridbrief.com. Always happy to plug uh, our friends. Um, he he found an old copy of a, of a famous book. And it, it, while opening this book on sort of the history of environmentalism, a, a, a letter fell out of it from the um, one of the early founders, the first executive director of the Sierra Club and, um, and the founder of Friends for Earth. And in this letter, he is congratulating himself on propagating the term, you know, population explosion and... Um, going on about um, the damage to nature that, quote, too many humans um, uh, are bringing to the earth. This was a letter from 1971. Most people don't realize, when I say Malthusian, I should explain. Um, <coughs> Malthus um, believed in population control um, all the way back, you know, centuries ago. And that school of thought has plagued many of our leaders. Like, instead of betting on human ingenuity and, uh, and imagining that we could provide a great standard of living for as many humans as possible while minimizing our damage to the planet, these people think we should just have less humans. And this ugly history <clears throat> is at the very genesis of the, of the modern environmental movement. And they're done, they've done their best to sort of um, to uh, whitewash that history. But um, it's there, it exists, and this letter shows it. And um, the key phrase there is too many people. And in our piece, you know, um, the author of that note lived a long life, died of natural causes at 88. You know, Godspeed. Uh, we wouldn't begrudge anybody of that. But um, he was undoubtedly in the uh, self pardon group of not too many. You know, um, how are you supposing to select uh, which humans are expendable and which ones deserve um, to live a free and full life? Um, and so you know, we, we think we have ethics on our side, and we certainly have physics on our side, and we think the capacity of Earth to support um, a robust number of humans um, is literally infinite. And uh, anybody who argues otherwise is a short human ingenuity. And um, destined to look foolish uh, through the through the lens of history. Uh, Doomberg, I wanted to ask you your thoughts on the modular reactors and the new technologies. Do you think that could swing public opinion enough and kind of start silencing the renewable zealots, or that's not really going to move the needle for you? Uh, they will be violently opposed to it. Um, you know, I, I'm a big fan of of all sort of nuclear technology. I know others in the space view, you know, um, small modular reactors as another distraction in the sense that um, doesn't really solve any of the key problems. But um, at the same time, you know, if that's what it takes to get nuclear over the line, we're kind of for it. But um, literally, in a piece we wrote about SMRs, we quoted some study from some professors on the West Coast claiming that uh, the amount of nuclear waste from an SMR per um, per watt of electricity produced was some order of magnitude higher than traditional reactors, which when you read it, you know, it's BS from the beginning. Like it just can't be true. Um, and of course you dig in and, and it's not true. Um, so they will attack SMRs just like they have attacked fusion. Again, SMR is a technology solution to what is a political problem. And that is the key point of the piece we're trying to make. Like we got to get better at politics. No amount of science is going to win these arguments. Um, the science is, is, is deeply in our corner. The technologies are, effectively infinitely safe. Um, the, the energy payback period on a new nuclear reactor is something like six weeks, you know, compared to multiple years for solar. Um, it, 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 they, they provide base load power compared to intermittent power for solar and wind. Like we have everything in our side. We literally just need to get better at, at, at politics. You know, thinking out loud, I'm thinking, you know, if there's more reactors nearby people, you know, like right now it's like a unicorn having a reactor in your backyard. And so there's that fear of meltdown that's yeah. misguided. What if everyone starts being like, oh, there's one in my backyard and I'm still here. Could that start changing public opinion? And I mean, it, it kind of normalizes it. The U.S. Navy has been running nuclear powered submarines flawlessly with a perfect safety record since the 1950s. How many thousands and thousands and thousands of submariners have worked, slept, been eaten, uh, you know, uh, eaten meals around nuclear reactors um, uh, with, with literally zero consequence. Yeah. Um, again, like 
this the thing we need to attack is the fear of nuclear meltdown. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and not the science of it. So, like, you could design a you know the latest generation reactors are essentially impervious to <laughs> meltdown risk. Um, nuclear waste we could totally handle today. Um, and yet, um, one of the problems with the industry is take nuclear waste. We um, Yucca Mountain was so over-designed versus what it's needed. It actually had the counterintuitive effect of making people think there must be a real problem here. Look at how difficult it is to build this depository that's supposed to last for millions and millions and millions of years. Like, it doesn't need that. Uh, radioactive decay is exponential. <laughs> Most of the risk goes away in the early years. Um, you know, uh, the odds of a, a well-encased um, small amount of nuclear waste uh, buried underground, several hundred meters, somehow breaking out through its encasement, finding its way back to the surface, and hurting a person is basically zero. Um, and so the harder you try to show just how much more safe you are in a perverse way, the more you feed into the fear mongering that the environmental radicals do, and you're playing right into their hands. These are professional propagandists, and we're amateur scientists. I mean, that. You know, we're, we're amateurs in the PR for, field because we're mostly scientists, I guess I, sh I should say. They're professional scientists, but when it comes to propaganda and politics, uh, most people in the uranium industry are, are woefully inadequate for the task. Zumer, for those that don't know, uh, Mar Margo, uh, Margo Rubin and uh, Doomberg did a, a fantastic piece on the history of energy shocks. And I think we just scratched the surface there uh, on just a, just just the ROI of uh, energy return of, of, of of uranium would love to let's let's open up the you know let's open up the nuclear channel and, and the uranium channel and just really uh you know d d dive into these points and visualize them i think there's just so much more we can you know we can really flesh out with this yeah education is a weapon yeah here. yeah so i mean at its core um energy density of the primary fuel being used dictates the utility that can be extracted from engineers who are given um that primary fuel and so um, in, in the piece um, that you referenced with Margot, um, we, we described what we call sort of the energy density ladder. Um, and just for carbon-based materials, you know, you can imagine a ladder, um, CO2, thermodynamic sink, sits on the ground. The first rung up the ladder is wood. The next rung up the ladder is coal. The next rung up the ladder is oil. And at the top, the top rung in the carbon world is, is natural gas, uh, methane, or CH4. Um, as you go higher up the ladder, you have more energy density to use as an engineer. Um, if you put uranium on that same ladder, you would imagine leaning a ladder against a skyscraper and the ladder is at the bottom of it and uranium sits at the top. Like it's not even on the same scale. Yeah. And so um, the power that can be extracted, the utility uh, that can be extracted from starting with a higher energy density fuel like uranium is amazing. Um, again, if you just think about it, um, we wrote a piece about the Colorado River and how, like, you know, the two largest dams on the Colorado River are doing all this damage to the ecosystems, you know, a, a couple of nuclear reactors, and you've replaced all that electricity. Right. You know, the footprint, the footprint of a parking lot at a McDonald's um, right. could, re could replace uh, all of the dams on the Colorado River. Um, and yet, here we are. And so, like, literally, physics dictates that the energy density is key. You can always slide down the ladder. So if you hand an engineer... A source of power that is orders of magnitude more than he or she needs the things they can do with that are amazing it's a lot harder to climb up the ladder of course which is why we don't you know uh, burn wood anymore we and, and lots of the world burn natural gas instead it's higher up on the ladder um, and so that fundamental truism um, is just undeniable and and once you know that and once you see that and once you believe that intuitively then you understand the challenges of taking, you know, dispersed forms of, of, of low entropy energy like solar and wind and then trying to aggregate it and ship it across long distances so that, you know, like, that's a very low density form of energy competing against the highest known energy density that we have, um, which is uranium. And so, as I said earlier, physics is on our side. The engineering is undeniable. Like these um, nuclear powered submarines could go vast distances and never have to surface. And, you know, they were... Uh, a giant leap uh, forward. And as we say in the piece, and I think it, it made its way into the documentary, um, you know, th there's a reason why we went from sailing ships to coal-powered ships to diesel-powered ships to nuclear-powered ships. 
we were climbing the energy density ladder. And in the military, physics matters, right? There's no room for platitudes when the, when the person on the other end is firing at you, right? And so there's a reason why every major military in the world went to nuclear-powered submarines instead of diesel-powered submarines. And you couldn't get away with um, sailing wind-powered vessels uh, in a modern Navy. Like the, the, their necessity, you know, physics dictates necessity. And it's, no, it's the exact same way in the civilian world. And um, starting with the highest form, highest energy density form of primary fuels wins every time. And um, societies who do that um, will, will succeed and will, uh, will be able to provide enormous standard of living upgrades for their societies, for their civilians. And, and those that don't, um, like the EU, will suffer. Um, what we're seeing in the European Union today is a consequence of proactively shutting down the highest uh, energy density forms of power and replacing them with low energy density sources of power like wind, solar, and burning wood. Um, it's no surprise that they are basically um, in, such a, in such a hurt locker today. Dunberg, they are always, they just, just the knowledge that you drop is always uh, so insightful. Like, first thing I'm going to Google up is just, j you know, just the, the, the submarines. And that, that's just an incredible track record. You, you know, that that's, and that if there's proof in the pudding here, it's just to see what's been, how successful nuclear has been um, in, you know, the, the opportunity for, for this to really fix a lot of the world's problems like dams, right? Like, you know, we can, we can have, we can have ecosystems come back. Of course, and, and, and we're seeing, again, one positive thing that we have seen, and we wrote a piece uh, long ago called the Green Shoots of Logic, where we gave credit where credit was due. Look, um, you know, the governor of California, we probably don't agree with, I personally probably don't agree with much of what Gavin Newsom has to say, but to his credit, when push came to shove, he saved Diablo Canyon, uh, the last remaining nuclear power plant in California. And uh, it was papered over politically as sort of a five-year extension and uh, Mark Nelson, good friend of ours um, at Energy Pants on Twitter, um, thinks it's going to be a multi-decade long uh, extension for Diablo Canyon. And that's the right decision. And congratulations to Gavin Newsom for, um, for taking it. Um, and, and, you know, it looks like um, our friend and, and aforementioned Chris Kiefer uh, and team in Canada have been successful in, um, in preserving, uh, you know, the, power, 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 the nuclear power plant in uh, Pickering, Ontario. Yes. Um, so good for him. Um, and so there's, you can do things, you could, you, 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 people do see the logic and eventually, of course they have to, because the, the only question before us is how much pain do we need to impose on people before they revolt and we take the, the route that physics dictates dicks that we must. Yeah. <laughs> physics rules at the end of the day and energy is life. And this is Doomberg, doomberg.substack.com, the legend, the number one finance substack in the world. Doomberg, thank you as always. Thank you, Doomberg. Hey. Guys, it was great. I really appreciate the flexibility. Sorry for uh, the schedule change last minute, but glad we can make it happen. Appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, did, we didn't want to miss an opportunity yeah. to chat with you. So that was Doomberg, everyone. All yeah, right, everyone, you. stay tuned. We're going to be gone for one second, and we're coming right back with the uh, uranium fire brand, uh, Mart Wolbert. He's done so much at a young age of contrarian codex. Don't go yeah. anywhere.
Hi, everyone. We're back for Uranium Grizzle one-on-one -on -one conference, and we're joined to close things off with none other than Mart Walbert. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. You guys had a great panel, and I'm honored to follow up uh, Doomberg as the last guest on the panel. <laughs> <laughs> well, so so we're calling you Mart, War Mart Walbert, but you're really known as Yellow Bull on Twitter. You have a huge following, um, but you also write uh, the newsletter Contrarian Codex. For those that don't know, can you just tell us a bit about what that's about? Yeah, I uh, started the Contrarian Codex to find contrarian investment opportunities, and the main focus is on uranium. Justin already mentioned it in his section that uranium has now, after the correction, really become a contrarian investment opportunity. Uh, once again, I completely agree with him. I think that given the fundamentals that we are seeing build up and it will come into play um, in 2023 and 2024, and given the price correction that we have seen since the highs of last year, I think that is a contrarian bet once again. So I'm really focused on that, but I'm also focused on other contrarian opportunities in the markets, wherever they may be found. And you've been a, you've been a uranium bull for a really long time. What are the key things that you're focusing on in the market right now or, or contrarian catalysts? Um, I would say that the three things that I'm most focused, of course, we have the supply demand gap, which is uh, the biggest focus, but the three things that I'm most focused on right now is the term contracting market, which is where the largest amounts of um, activity happens. A lot of people are focused on the spot market, but the tour market is where uh, most people should be watching. So what we're seeing right now in the tour markets, we're seeing utilities come back to the tour markets. We're seeing no negotiations for term contracts heat up. And what we're also seeing is that these contracts, they're now being negotiated for, for longer time frames. So instead of, for example, five years, they're now being negotiated for eight, 10 years to 12 years. So much longer, but also for larger volumes. So that's what we're seeing. What I'm also watching is the prices of US6 and SWU, so that's the price for conversion enrichment in the uranium space. We now see US6 price at $170. We're seeing SWU at $125. We're seeing conversion at $40. And those are all much higher than they were a few years ago. So we've seen a bull market in those prices. And what people that are not really familiar with uranium should know is that in every previous uranium bull cycle, we've seen the prices of conversion and enrichment go up first and then the uranium price has followed this time will be no different so these are really telling the story of what the uranium price will be doing next year in my opinion and also the last one is uh, what financial entities may do as well uh, to the space especially when liquidity returns we've had a pretty tough year um, as have a lot of other asset classes and this has really drained liquidity from a small very small uh, uranium sector with total market cap around 35 billion dollars when you round up all the publicly listed uranium companies and this is a tiny sector so when liquidity goes it really goes and but when it comes back um, with a vehicle like sprott as well which is a amazingly managed vehicle and i spoke to ceo john kim Pagla before i'm going to speak to him again in january and he manages it very well and i think they've done a great job so with that in place i think the fundamentals are absolutely incredible and i'm so so excited to see what 2023 has to offer wow that, that that's a lot there and definitely some good points to to focus on but i want to follow up on the demand side we know europe's in the middle of an energy crisis right now and that has energy security really at the forefront of a lot of countries right now japan's talking about like restarting some idle nuclear reactors how do you see this all playing out in terms of demand going forward well, the demand side is uh, increasingly becoming more and more bullish for uh, uranium, which is also good from a humanitarian side of view because uh, you want to see more nuclear power. As Doomberg perfectly laid out, we want nuclear power as part of the energy grid because it's green, it's reliable, and the energy density, <clears throat> sorry, the energy density matters. So what we're seeing in Asia, as you alluded to, Japan, they are restarting a bunch of their nuclear power plants after which were shuttered in after um, Fukushima happened. And with their goal of 22% of their grid uh, being nuclear power, nu nuclear powered by 2030, they really need to start restarting those power plants, perhaps even build some new ones. So that's something that we see as a tailwind for uh, uranium demand. And while we're are in Asia anyway, like you can look at South Korea as well. They have a 24.5 gigawatt fleet with another four gigawatts under construction. And with the new government there, they are now really focusing on it. You see China, which is really the big growth story in this regard. You see them recently in the past few months, they were revising their 
guidance upwards to the amount of nuclear power plants they want to approve and construct in the coming decade. And they are targeting between 130 gigawatts to 150 gigawatts by 2035 and around 10 nuclear reactors approved and built each and every single year going forward, which is just an incredible amount of demand. And even like earlier this week, what we saw was the government of India going in and saying that they are planning to add 21 nuclear power plants to the grid by 2031, I believe, which is absolutely incredible. And then how, I guess I can't ask you this without following up on supply. How do you see the supply story following up with this? Like, do you think the gap between supply and demand is just going to continue to widen or, or what's your outlook on that? I do, especially at $50 uranium, because at $50 uranium, you will not see a lot of new supply coming online, especially not with, I just mentioned Asia, but you also have nuclear power plants in Europe, in the Middle East, as well as, of course, in the US and Canada. You see those power plants getting life extensions, them being online for perhaps more than the 60 years or 40 years that they were originally planned for. And that just keeps an enormous amount of demand in place. All the while, as I've just mentioned, supply, new projects are not coming online at $50. A lot of juniors have fancy presentations that tell you, okay, we can bring new projects online at $50 or $40. That's not gonna happen, especially not if your presentation is older than say 2018, let's say it's from 2014 or 2011 even. Costs have gone up substantially. So we're now coming into an all in sustained cost per pound to mine for new projects around in the high $70 area. Going into the $80 area, given the supply bottlenecks, as well as everything that comes with it and inflation, of course. So I don't see the supply side really coming online. We have some projects. We have, for example, Uzbekistan, we can ramp up. We have Kazakhstan, we have some uh, production capacity that they can ramp up. But there is really not much that the supply side can do. And I can see the supply demand gap widening all the way through to the end of this decade into the 2030s, unless we see a substantial increase in the price of uranium. And that is exactly what I think we're going to see. And do you have, or if you don't, that's really cool, but do you have like an estimate on, on where you see the uranium spot price going, maybe long term or? That's a great question. Um, I'm going to take it one step at a time, see how you tell it. And, 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 and maybe I can add one layer to that. You know, you know walk us through, because obviously near term prices are hard to, to you know, to to predict but you know what's your long what's on margo's point what's your long-term price and, and maybe you can back us into like what's that triggers in a marginal is it the marginal cost of you know the 95th percentile how do you think about that i would say that if you want to bring the most amount of projects online you need a sustained price of uranium above 80 or 85 dollars so i think that's exactly where we're going to go but the beauty about cyclical commodity investing, which is not just reserved for uranium, it's the same with oil, with precious metals, with whatever commodity under the sun. Um, once it go, we had a long 10 year bear market. So once it goes to that approximate equilibrium price level of around 80, $85, what you see is that it usually, it busts right through there and uh, goes for a blow off top before likely settling back around that equilibrium price level, maybe a bit lower than that because it's cyclical. So I think we need to go to 80, 85. I think we can well go there before the end of 2023. But I think ultimately we have a very good chance, especially with financial players in the market, that we go much higher than at 80, 85 dollar level before this uranium uh, bull market is over. Fantastic. Now, um you're based in Europe, uh, Mart, and, and you obviously, you know, we had, we had a great discussion of just obviously lots of things happening in Europe around energy. The crisis is, you know, that's you're you're in, you're in ground zero there. Um, is there an uptick in nuclear just given what we're seeing right now at, at, at a I call it a, there's the, the populist level, then there's the political level. Then secondarily, um, you know, are people taking a, a differentiated view on, you know, the the topic of ESG and is nuclear a tick there or not? Or, you know, what's the evolution? Well, there's definitely going through a lot of positive developments right now. I'm from the Netherlands and we, our government has recently approved two new nuclear power plants, which is great. And the news, well, I think if a few years ago, this news would have come out, I think it would have been met with a lot more skepticism, but this time it's been met with less skepticism and more, um, more positive, positive, well, let's call it positive vibes. Um, towards this, which is great to see. And when it comes to investing as well, 
we have uh, earlier this year we saw nuclear power being included in the EU taxonomy together with gra together with gas. And what this does is this opens the door next year for more investment because before you saw um, institutional capital, uh, whatever the capital may come from, you saw them being penalized if they would add nuclear power related investments to their portfolio. They would they would be um, they would penalized for it by saying, okay, you guys can't do this because nuclear power is not green. Uh, but now that it's part of the EU taxonomy and now that governments around the world are more positive towards it, as well as investors being more well informed towards it, those capital, um, those, uh, those institutions um, are now able to invest it in but without being penalized. So I think that the story um, is becoming more open to more investments from all kinds of different sides. And I think this helps as well educate more people about the positives of nuclear power and the opportunity um, that is presenting itself right now, because I think it's a massive opportunity. And frankly, um, as I mentioned at the start at the Codex, I try to find investment opportunities wherever they might appear. Uh, but try as I might, I've never found something as bullish as uranium. And I keep trying, but there is nothing coming up right now that even closely matches the bullish fundamentals that uranium has. A true yellow bull, as they say. <laughs> <laughs> what, a, what you know we won't even get to that point but you know the rick rule the rick relaxing yeah, but he you know rick is like listen there will be a point to sell but we're nowhere close to that right yeah absolutely we have a long long way to go and i think that 2023 and 2024 um will be a lot better of course we have some my my own views on where the broad market might go and where liquidity might go in the first half of 2023 but after that i think very very good fundamentals can only be sustain can only be well, held back for so long. And at some point, this concrete slab is going to get blown off. And if you don't have a seat at the table, I think you're going to miss the run because this thing could go very, very fast. I always say slowly, 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 and then all at once. And I think that's what we're going to see with the price of uranium. And, and before we let you go, I just want to get your opinion on this because we've asked most of our guests about this. But what do you think of the fusion energy breakthrough that was revealed earlier this week by U.S. scientists? Is this a kind of a game changer or a threat to the nuclear energy industry? And not at all. I think that Chris and Doomberg, they both uh, laid the case out perfectly. I think that it's great to have this in the news. It's great that they're developing it because as a, as a human race, we need all the energy we can get. And if we can get cheap, abundant energy, that would be great. But a cheap, abundant energy can come in the form of the nuclear power technology that we have right now. I would say that this new breakthrough, it's, it's good to see. And we should definitely develop it further. But it's, pro it's potentially still decades away before it's... Uh, fully commercialized and from the drawing table from the research table until full global commercialization and implementation we are a long way away so it's in no way show perform a bear case for uranium um right now what a what a wonderful interview there uh mark uh tell people how they can find you obviously i, I know you on twitter uh, great job uh you know bringing great insights at, at is it at yellow bull, is at, yellow bull, yeah. at yellow bull um, and then just where else? What are, you have websites here. Where, 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 can, where can we find you? Oh, they can find me at, at Yellow Bull 11 on Twitter, as you alluded to, but they can also find my work on patreon.com slash contrarian codex. And if anyone has any questions or they would like a sample portfolio or anything or a sample of my work, um, they can reach me at contrarian codex at gmail.com. And I am looking forward to any questions or any lot of emails that I get. Mart, thank you so much. That's Mart Walbert, founder of Contrarian Codex, the newsletter. And you can also find him on Twitter at Yellow Bull. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Guys, we need some thumbs up for more to Doomberg. Get the, get the thumbs up. Let's go. No, guys, thank you so much for the wonderful audience here. hearing a great day. Guys, hold on for one second. We'll be back to wrap up. Uh, thank our wonderful partners and, and some takeaways. Uh, the graphs that maybe some people didn't see, we'll bring back up. Uh, stay tuned. We'll be back in a minute.
All right, we're back. Not bad. Hey. All right, everyone. <laughs> there we go. I hope you guys stuck around because we didn't disappoint. It was good at the beginning. It was good in the middle. It was good at the end. Oh man. yeah, guys. You, what what a what a tour de force for uranium. Uh, we we thought we would we would miss Doomberg came back and delivered a uh, just incredible performance. Uh, four great companies. Like really, like I learned a ton from from four great companies. We had Anfield, uh, Can Alaska, Fission 3.0. And then, uh, and then, uh, what was the last one, Scott? Um, oh, I have it right here. Yeah, Enfield. Oh Enfield, yeah, Enfield. Enfield, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Enfield Energy. So Enfield Energy. That, that was a great, great, great conversation with William. Um, it, yeah, it was a fantastic afternoon. And if you guys didn't miss, you got to rewind that. Rick Rule. That was whoo. Man, and that's the first time we've sat down with. Yeah, him. I've never actually talked to Rick, so I was, <clears> I was <throat> thoroughly impressed. Uh, Tom said he was, you know, he's going to be a great conversation and. That was. Yeah, like and guys, and everyone on YouTube, I gotta say, like, this is one of the most engaging uh YouTube uh you know, just comment audiences. Like great questions. Yeah, hand, handy you guys. Yeah, guys, like awesome. thank you so much. And thanks for uh thank you know, thanks for the support. Please share this uh with uh, friends. I and I think one of the takeaways, if you guys were listening and it, it kind of resonated with me, there are obviously a ton of takeaways, but um you know, Duberg said it best, right? This is not a science problem, this is a public perception problem. Yeah. And that's easier to solve, right? Yeah, way easier to solve. And, and so, you 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 know, th that's one of those things where you're like, you know, there's a ton of info here. Uh, Chris Chris Kiefer was like, that was, a, that was like for our, obviously our first time Commitment talking. to uranium, baby. <clears throat> like. that, that was fantastic. That was a great way to kick off the conference. It actually all worked out perfectly, right? Because we had Chris Kiefer in the front, Doomer in the back, Rick in the Rick in the middle. Great companies, a gr great day. And not to, we'd be in this. Uh, we, we, it was uh, great to have Dave Talbot. If you guys are checking out Red Cloud Throws and amazing conferences on mining, a base here in Toronto, they do two a year that are blowout. Uh, we had a fantastic time with them. Scott, why don't we talk about the partners that made this all possible? Yeah. So we, we, we got to thank our partners. You know, number one is Doomberg. It's the number one finance substack, doomberg.substack.com. That team, they can write about anything. They're great writers. They're insightful. They go from crypto to uranium to commodities. So don't miss Doomberg. <laughs> Next, we got Red Cloud, obviously. They're your source for high quality mining research and insight. They actually, their research is free. So I'd recommend checking it out if you're interested in uranium or commodities, redcloudfs.com. Then we have Uranium Insider. We spoke to Justin Hewn. Uh, they're, they are the leading authority in the uranium market. They provide news analysis and they help you identify the leading companies. They spend a lot of time on companies, so very helpful. Uraniuminsider.com. And then we got Grizzle Research and Quant. That's grizzleresearch.substack.com. It's our take on looking at investing through a quant lens. There's not a lot of that on Substack. We want to do something different. What you get there is you get stock picks, you get market analysis, you get deep dives and you get insights on how to put together a portfolio. So free to sign up, check that out. Let us know what you think. We're always improving it, always open to ideas. Yeah, you know what? Um, yeah, we'll pop back and so like great, great group of partners right there. Um, and just on the Grizzle uh, Research and Quant, one of the one of the things we look at is just price differentials. Uh, so let, let's bring up that commodity, comparing commodity charts, uh, Zach. Yeah, wonderful chart right here. I'm gonna just pull it up. This was one we 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 had we started the conference with, but I think it's an important one, Scott. The one is one of the biggest takeaways. Scott and I are, uh, have a deep history in commodity investing. Uh, I was at TD Asset Management. I was head of uh, head of uh, resource investing there. And Scott, you worked on the sell side. Yeah, I was I was on the sell side. You know, doing deep research on individual stocks. Um, went to the buy side, met Tom there. But we our our backgrounds really our wheelhouse is commodities. Yeah. So that's that's what we understand the best. And uh, so, what do you want? To point yeah. Out so what, what I want to say trends? is that in commodities, there's one thing you're always always concerned with is: am I getting a deal on the 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 companies that are that are producing the commodity, or you know, or, or relative to the commodity itself, right? Yeah. And so this year, we've seen two examples. Scott, you want to talk about what's happened in energy? Yeah, so energy has been interesting because, you know, the commodity has performed well, outperformed the general market, but the stocks have done even better and they've held in lately, even though people are getting more worried about economic growth. Will the Fed take things too far? You've seen the oil price tail off a bit. 
but the stocks are holding it really well. Typically, that doesn't happen because stocks make money off the oil price. And you see it works both ways. There's a lot of leverage in the companies. So when the price is going down, their earnings are falling faster. So that basically says the market doesn't believe that energy is really weakening like it is. And so we'll have to see who's right. This has happened in the past. Every time the stocks follow the commodity, but this isn't a normal energy market we're in. A very, a very big anomaly. And I'll bring back that chart. I didn't really talk to that chart, but I'll talk to it quickly right now. And so the, what this is, is just showing your date commodity prices. And it's interesting, right? <clears throat> the, the leader by far has been nickel up 35%, then followed by uranium as represented by the Sprout Uranium Trust up six, 6.4%. Then oil's been flat, Scott. M- mind you, and while well, the stocks are still up quite a lot, right? You know, yeah. they, uh, and then finally, uh, copper is down fourteen percent. So we're looking for these anomalies. Now let's pull up the next chart. <clears throat> uh, we're going to pop to the next chart, which, which deals with uranium. Scott, you want to talk to this because it's showing a different. This is so. If one side was oil stocks, the 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 company producers are doing better than the commodity. This is the flip. Yeah, so this is looking at the uh, physical uranium in in white and then the companies that mine uranium and sell it in blue. And so you see it's similar to what's happening in nickel, which we we can talk about opposite of what's happening in oil. Producers not holding up as well as the commodity itself. So that's an opportunity because remember, they make their money off the commodity. So over time, you generally see that difference converge whenever there is a, uh, you know, a big difference between the producer and the commodity. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of people, you know, um, the folks, the investors from Rick Rule to, to Dave Talbot, uh, we can kill the graph, you know, all, you know, everyone you've hear, heard from here is listen, one thing that's clear about uranium is, is and a, I would highly recommend have another listen to Rick Rule, a commodity veteran. He's about, been through multiple yeah, uranium cycles. Yeah. Like, you know, we've had a we had a bunch of guests today who've been through multiple cycles, but he's the only one who's been there from an investing angle the whole time. Yeah, in, in across all commodities. He, yeah. He, he's uh commodity commodities leave scars on investors. <laughs> he had a great yeah. little analog there. You know, he 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 um you know he he was very wealthy, then he got uh, poor and but then he he was much richer after. That is the story of every uh commodity. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So uh, great insights there. But uh, right now we feel, you know, we're still, there's still early days. Uh, and I think putting together the political um, winds are changing along with a public perception. Uh, it, it's an, it, it's a very exciting time to be a uranium investor. Uh, we had four great companies. We had Corey Diaz from Anfield Energy. Watch that. Um, Corey Belk, back to back. Corey's Can Alaska. Dev. Uh, from the Fission 3.0 and William uh, Sheriff from uh, Encore Energy. Uh, g- g- each one of those companies, will, you'll, you'll learn a ton. They can talk to the industry, but more specifically, they can talk to the opportunities within their companies. Yeah, make sure to share this with anyone. If you have any friends who don't know anything about uranium and may, or may mention it to you that they want to learn, I don't think there's been a better you know, two or three hours for us. We, we always try to set yep. this up where we're learning as well as providing entertainment. I think this uh, this delivered. Yeah, guys, really appreciate uh, everyone tuning in. And and if you kindly, if you're, if you're watching on Twitter, we had a huge Twitter audience, please give it that retweet. I, that would be grateful. And for those <coughs> on YouTube, if you haven't done thumbs up, give it a thumbs up and give, give Gristle a follow. Margo's done a phenomenal uh, series on energy and we're going to embark, we're going to, do a, a series on nuclear power as well. And we got some other uh, other real uh, exciting points on the battery metal side. We're going to keep going. Grizzle is your home for commodities. So make sure you subscribe. And investing. And investing. All right. Well, thanks so much, everyone, for tuning in. That's all for us. But we'll be back soon with another conference. You know, we just keep on rolling. Guys, thank you so much. Happy holidays. Wonderful 2023. Oh,